Wisconsin versus Daryl Brooks, case number 21, CF 1848. May I have the appearances, please? Tony Judge Sue Upper, Leslie Basie, and Zach Wichell appearing for the state of Wisconsin. I'm here as a third party intervener in that matter, appearing as authorized representative for my client. I accept for value and return for value all of the charging instruments in this matter and make my exemption available for the discharge of all obligations and charges connected with this case. I do not dispute any of the facts in the charging instruments and make a reservation of all my rights here this morning. All rights reserved. All right, good morning to you as well. The records reflect the individual known to this court as Daryl Brooks is present in person in custody. However, he is wearing street clothes, a suit and tie, and a mask. And for the record, I don't consent to being caught in it. It is noted. All right, Mr. Brooks, just preliminarily, do you anticipate calling any additional witnesses today? For the record, I don't consent to being caught in that name. And what was the question? Do you anticipate calling any witnesses today? I don't believe today. Well, we are here for the continuation of testimony. The only witness that I'm aware of that's on your list that you added is your mother, Dawn Woods. So I would expect that if she's going to testify, she would be here. Otherwise, I will be going through the colloquy with you as to whether you intend to testify today or not. Did you receive my ICS that I addressed to you? I haven't looked. Let me look. Actually, I just went to you and then went to the prosecution. Is the audio on? It is. The audio is on. Do you know when you sent those? Saturday. So that would have been the 22nd. State receive anything through like the inner office communication? We have not. I just checked this morning to see if there's anything new. Nothing has been received at my office. And I should say the clerical that was assisting me went to the mail room to double check. So not only has it not made its way to the DA's office, it hasn't even made its way over to the mail room. I can email the jail administrator to find out if there's anything in transit, if there's no objection from the parties, from the state. No objection. From you, sir? No objection. I definitely want those documents received as they obtain important information. You said you forwarded them to a staff member on Saturday? Yes. Do you know if that was morning, afternoon, or some other time? Maybe afternoon. And those are two ICF forms? Yep. One addressed to you directly and one addressed to the district attorney's office. I'm sending that. I will send it with high importance and see what response I get. But I don't have anything. If you want to generally tell me the topic, we can cover it verbally. The topic is pertaining to exculpatory evidence. Some things were learned and once they came to my attention, I felt the need to immediately address the court about this information. 
All right, what the, information? Make an offer of proof for me, sir. The, uh, the expert witness uh, for the prosecution in, in regards to, um, I believe it was inspecting the vehicle, uh, uh, Officer Ryan Schultz, um, question was asked of, did he know if there were any uh, recalls on that vehicle and I believe that uh, a Brady claim should be visited because there were in fact recalls on that vehicle in, in fact there were recalls on the Ford Escape models from 2008 through 2010 um, in regards to the throttle body malfunctioning and causing the vehicles to accelerate and not being able to be stopped. Um, there is a class action lawsuit where four company were sued because of this and those vehicles models from the year 2008 through 2010 were recalled. And that is very important information in regards to the vehicle in question being a Ford Escape 2010. Um, this information is very easily obtained just by pulling it up and you will see a class action lawsuit. Obviously, if it's a class action lawsuit, then it's pretty easy to. So what's be, your request, sir? Uh, my request is to find out if Officer Schultz knew to find out if the prosecution knew that there was a recall on those vehicles. And in light of the, uh, the fact that these vehicles were recalled because of this malfunctioning uh, throttle body for, uh, I believe it's counts one through 73 to be dismissed. All right, what's the response from the state, if any? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as Trooper Schultz testified um, during his examination, um, consistent with our research, there are no active recalls listed for the Ford Escape. As Trooper Inspector Schultz noted, noted during his testimony, that uh, Ford listed an extended warranty for the throttle body on the escape. The warranty was extended to 10 years of age and 150,000 miles. The escape is more than 10 years old and has more than 150,000 miles. Um, also, he noted specifically in his report that he did not note any defect in the throttle body as previously described in this report. Um, there was no recall in the throttle body. Um, NHTSA did do an investigation into allegedly defective Ford throttle bodies, which would have impacted this year. Basically, the electronic throttle body failures would have resulted in engine stall or surge while entering traffic from a stop position or while driving at highway speeds, um, neither of which I believe occurred here. Further, tr uh, Inspector Schultz would testify that um, that does not prevent the brake from working. So if this had been activated on this car, which it was not, but if it had been, and this defendant would have pushed down on the brake, um, it would have stopped the car. Uh, further, if this was a problem, there would have been um, the malfunction indicator lamp or the wrench light would have been illuminated as Trooper Schultz, um, or Inspector Schultz testified, when he started the vehicle and checked the um, indicator lights, none of them were lit. Further, if there was this, he would have um, observed material buildup on the commutator. Um, there was no such buildup observed. There were no problems um, with the throttle, um, electronic throttle body. Um, that was part of his report. Uh, therefore, this is 
although there may have been some cars who had this problem, the car that the defendant was driving on this date did not have that problem. That was testified during the vehicle inspection. The defendant had the opportunity to cross-examine Inspector Schultz with regard to that. And again, in running the defendant's mom's VIN number through NHTSA, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, there are, for this particular VIN number, for this car that the defendant was driving, zero unrepaired recalls. So it's a moot issue. I don't believe it's a moot issue. And I actually have, it should, the report should be in the mail room as we speak. I had everything sent over priority mail. The actual information about the class action lawsuit, the actual information about the recalls for those models, like I said, 2008 through 2010. Now, in all fairness, Your Honor, that's why I was asking for a Brady claim on this. Seeing as how when vehicles are purchased from the manufacturer, they're still sold as is. There would be no way to know that there's anything malfunctioning with the vehicle until it actually happens. And seeing as a class action lawsuit, no one would sue the Ford company if there weren't malfunctioning vehicles. There would be no class action lawsuit if these vehicles were not malfunctioning. And I believe with that, like I said, the information is easily obtainable. I should have the information in the mail room right now that you can readily view this information about the class action lawsuit, about the recall. It wasn't just the 2010 model in question. It was 2008 through 2010. The information about the malfunctioning pertains strictly to the throttle body. Let me address your claim, sir. So, not trying to cut you off, I don't need the specifics about a class action because as it relates to this case, the fact that there's a class action would not mean there's a Brady violation by the state. In fact, you even indicate it was readily known and something you were able to find out. I'd further note that you had a full and fair opportunity to cross-examine the inspector regarding his mechanical inspection. It's not new information. And more importantly, as it relates to this particular vehicle, based upon the testimony of Inspector Schultz, it's speculative as to whether this vehicle would be impacted, number one, by the class action, and number two, any throttle body problems. Because, again, there was a full inspection. That report was provided to you. He testified on direct examination about there being no active recalls. And more importantly, he testified about what impact the throttle body would have and what he would expect to see if there were any issues with it. I am aware that the ICF, I did receive an email. It's one page with what you said. I have to turn my head. I've got to figure out how to flip it. So give me a second. Okay. Just for the record, Your Honor. Hold on. Let me finish my record, okay? So I'm going to turn because it's the only way I can read it. It says, your ICF says the state's expert witness who did the inspection on the vehicle in this incident needs to be recalled. No later than Wednesday, I just learned of some information that is extremely vital. So I understand the information that you're providing me. But, again, you had a full and fair opportunity to cross-examine this witness. This information was apparently well known. I'd also note the vehicle's registered to your mother. And from my understanding of recalls, I think what is common knowledge is that a registered owner would receive information regarding the recalls and what to do. 
um, and presumably she would have provided that information uh, to anyone operating that vehicle or taking care of it. We have none of that information before us by way of fact or even an offer of proof that even she received that information and did nothing with it or whether um, anyone else who operated that uh, did anything with it or not. The bottom line is there is absolutely no Brady violation by the state. This is not the type of information they would have been required to turn over. Um, and from my understanding and review of Exhibit 83, um, what's important to this case is that the mechanical inspection specifically looked at that issue nonetheless and found that as to this particular vehicle, uh, there were no issues with that that would have impacted the mechanical function uh, during the incident in question. Um, I'll accept the state's offer of proof as to what would have been the issues based upon the information provided. And again, without anything further from you by way of your offer of proof, I can't uh, make a finding, number one, that there's a Brady violation, and number two, that the information you seek to cross-examine him on would have any impact whatsoever. So I'll deny the request to dismiss the case, and I'll deny the request to recall this witness. Hey, you're Hold on. Let, hold on. Um, let me have the state just make their statement. I'll give you the last word on it. Go Thank ahead. You. Um, the inspector Schultz's mechanical inspection report was provided to the defense on April 29, 2022. I noted that when the defendant was cross-examining Inspector Schultz, um, he did have the report in front of him and it was questioning, um, asking questions directly related to information contained in that report. All right, go ahead, Mr. Brooks. The, when you spoke to the owner of the vehicle, that's who gave me the information. My mother gave me the information of, of this. I didn't. I had no knowledge until she told me. And that's how I came into the information. And she was the one that said, I'm going to send you all the information that you need so you can present it to the court. So I, I didn't. This I understand that, sir, this but wasn't your request is not timely. So you have had this information for quite some time, either through counsel. I did not have it for quite Let some time. Let me make time. my record, it was just, either through counsel. It was just told to me. That's not what I'm saying. You've had the information about this report for quite some time, either through prior counsel or through um, all of the discovery that was turned over to you when you took over your representation of your own case. The fact that you have now learned this, um, it's a little bit too late. And I understand that may seem fair to you, but when I even when I consider the information that you're providing to me, it's it's speculative on your part as to whether there's any impact on this particular vehicle because of the inspection that was done. And you had a full and fair opportunity to cross-examine the inspector about information that was readily obtainable and researchable by you prior to the time that you uh, cross-examined this witness. It was not really readily available for me to expect at the time. I don't have access to the internet. So how, how would I be able to... Mr. Brooks, you're telling uh, me your mother had that information. No, so, I'm and telling I'm gonna you trust she just told me this information. I have the phone calls to prove it. I understand that I'm denying the request, sir. And I, I would like a... a I so that's my that. decision. I object to that, Your Honor. I understand. I I've made my decision. That. I expect that you respect the decision, at least no. as we're not going to debate it further. Yes. I now have the um, ICF, be, um, the one from the state, provided to the state. Address, to the state. Um, Madam Clerk, I just gave that to you. All right, so Mr. I respectfully Brooks, object. That, I respectfully object, Your Honor, and request a legal reconsideration of your ruling, Your Honor. Um, de it's denied. The request for reconsideration is denied. There's no legal basis for me to do I that I respectfully at this point. reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Brooks, we need to keep going. For the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling, Your Honor? I provided an oral ruling today. The record stands, sir. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law on this issue? Your request is denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for an interlocutory declaratory appeal of this matter? Um, 
I wouldn't be the one you would make that request to, sir. So I can't For the record, ma'am, move yes to stay no. these proceedings until the instant matter is adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction. That request is denied. Based on what law or fact, Your Honor? The request is denied. Based on what law or fact, what, Your Honor? Any other requests, sir, I'd like to move on. Based on what law? There's no or legal fact. basis that you've stated for me to do that, sir. There has, it has been, Your Honor. The request is denied. The request is not a proper motion. It's, there's no legal support for the motion. There's no factual support for the motion. So it's denied. For the record, it appears that this court is acting in contempt of the law, Your Honor. Can you show me how or where this court is following the law in respect, respecting this matter? That's a very vague statement, sir. There's no legal relief that you're claiming. There's no motion before the court based in law or fact. So this court cannot address that last statement of yours. Your Honor, with all due respect, I would like a motion for finding a fact. Denied. Under what law and fact? I made an oral ruling, sir. There's no requirement I do so in writing. So you're denying a legal, you're denying a motion for finding a fact? I am. So how do I know what you're doing is legal, Your Honor? All right, Mr. Brooks, we're going to move forward. At this time, I want to... How do I know that this is legal, Your Honor? Can you show me that it's legal? Mr. Brooks, we're moving forward. So your request is denied. It doesn't seem like it. Mr. Brooks, I need to give you some advice. It doesn't seem like it. I don't need your advice. I need you... No, I have to give you advisements, sir, regarding your right to testify. I need you to do your job without prejudice and without bias, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks has now interrupted me multiple times. He's failing to respect the court's oral rulings here today. It's something that he's done repeatedly throughout this trial. Mr. Brooks, I need to go through some advisements. Unless you have a witness to immediately call, I need to go through this particular discussion on the record with you regarding your right to testify. Do you have a witness to call, sir? You don't need to go through anything with me on record. Actually, I do so, sir. That is required by law. Actually, you don't. You need to do your job as a public servant and honor the oath that you took, Your Honor. I need to go through these advisements, and if you're going to keep interrupting me, you will forfeit your right to be present, and you will be removed to the next courtroom so that I can properly go through these advisements without being interrupted. And I still don't have to answer. I still don't have to answer whether I'm in this court or not, so you're holding me in contempt yet again. Mr. Brooks, I've not held you in contempt. I've found that you have forfeited your right to be present, and you will be removed to the next courtroom. Mr. Brooks, I've not held you in contempt. I've found that you have forfeited your right to be present by your conduct, which is one of the options available to this court under Illinois v. Allen, under State v. Vaughn. It's also referenced in State v. Anthony. So I am going to keep going, sir, despite your protestations. Your Honor, with all due respect, in Illinois v. Allen, this is another interruption. In Illinois v. Allen, Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to have a debate with you on the meaning of Illinois v. Allen. I'm not trying to have a debate. You are advised that it continued. I'm merely trying to understand Illinois v. Allen. Mr. Brooks, you are advised that continued interruptions will result in you forfeiting your right to be present during this next phase of the trial. Okay, but you saying that I'm forfeiting my right. I've said that multiple times. I've given you multiple opportunities to stop interrupting me. You're holding me in contempt. Mr. Brooks, I'm not holding you in contempt for the second time here, and I've also repeated that. Your Honor, with all respect. He's interrupting me yet again. Mr. Brooks, I need you to stop talking. With all respect, in Illinois v. Allen. All right, Mr. Brooks continues to want to debate with me the meaning of Illinois v. Allen. It is a clear indication to this court that he wants to disrupt these proceedings, even in a mild manner, tone of voice. That's not true. I've reminded him repeatedly regarding the standards of performance, civility, and one of the bedrocks is that he not interrupt. Illinois v. Allen does not state. All right, I'm going to remove him to the next courtroom so that I can go through proper advisements with him without being interrupted. It does not state that you can be present from cameras. Once he is over there, again, I'll make the appropriate findings when he is there. It doesn't state that you can be present from cameras or that you can be. Yes, we're off the record. Or that you can be. Okay, so you're making a tacit agreement.
Madam Clerk, might please get verification that the audio and video are working in the neighboring courtroom. All right, thank you. I do have verification. There are headphones on the table in front of Mr. Brooks should he uh, choose to wear them. I see he's reading from a book at the moment. I do need to make a record that this morning, although Mr. Brooks was not raising his voice, there were repeated interruptions. Um, he wanted to debate rulings that I made after the fact um, just this morning alone. About 26, 27 different times he interrupted me or spoke over me. Um, once I made a decision on his motion to dismiss and his request to recall um, a witness, he then asked if I, uh, for written findings. I denied that. Um, he then asked for what law I was uh, following. I indicated I wouldn't explain that further, that I already made an oral ruling. He asked for um, uh, a stay. He asked for dismissal. All of those things I either denied or said I wouldn't answer, uh, specifically as it relates to the request for an interlocutory appeal, since I would not be the judge or uh, court to which uh, a request would be made. That is something that would be made to the Court of Appeals. Um, and uh, although I would have authority to grant a stay pending appeal, there is no appeal that's pending. Um, I gave Mr. Brooks multiple opportunities to stop talking. I asked him repeatedly to stop interrupting me. I advised him that if he continued, he would forfeit his right to be present in this courtroom and would be taken to the neighboring courtroom. Um, I believe I gave that warning at least twice. Um, of course, this comes on the record before this court over the first 15 days of trial where Mr. Brooks has, by his conduct, forfeited his right to be present on a number of occasions due to his conduct. I do appreciate that this morning he didn't yell at me, he didn't raise his voice, he didn't speak in an angry tone, uh, but given the history in this case leading up to today and knowing what this court needs to get through in terms of whether he has any witnesses um, or whether he intends to testify himself, there's a very important um, colloquy I need to have and an advisement of his rights that I need to go through and I simply am not able to do that with him constantly interrupting me and then not respecting the oral rulings that are made. Of course, at any point in time, Mr. Brooks can ask to be brought back over to this courtroom under Illinois versus Allen. Of course, he needs to uh, pledge that he is willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concepts of courts and judicial uh, proceedings. I, of course, have repeatedly, even without him making such a pledge, brought him back into the courtroom where I felt a sufficient time has passed. Um, and he, at many times, has been able to conform his conduct. Uh, I would note during the vast majority of the uh, testimony that was provided during the state's case, he was in the courtroom, um, if not during the entire time. He was able to cross-examine witnesses. Um, we had a couple of issues during the testimony of witnesses he called. And of course, last Friday was, in my opinion, probably one of the most challenging dates, uh, challenging days, I should say, to date. Um, it's my hope that we can continue with Mr. Brooks um, in this courtroom. Um, at some point today, I'll certainly invite him back over uh, when I get through these advisements. Um, Mr. Brooks, you have been muted. I will make that, uh, put that on the record as well. I will unmute though and ask Mr. Brooks because you did not answer the question previously. Other than you potentially testifying on your behalf, do you have any other witnesses present at the courtroom, at the courthouse to call today? I need an answer to that question, sir. That we haven't addressed 
when I was just over here, or since I've been over here, are we addressing subject matter jurisdiction? I'm going to mute him just for a second. No, I'm not going to address subject matter jurisdiction. This is a common ploy by Mr. Brooks. When I attempt to go through certain things with him, ask him questions, he tries to divert our attention away to subject matter jurisdiction. I have issued a written decision on that. Um, he has not filed any type of interlocutory appeal regarding that. Um, this court's position is there is subject matter jurisdiction, and I'll deny um, verbally and orally at this point his request to dismiss the case based on a lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Mr. Brooks, I will be asking you a couple of questions. I do need a response. I am unmuting you. Um, do you have any other witnesses other than yourself available at the courthouse to call this morning, meaning um, now? This is the uh, jurisdictional challenge right here. So are you going to address subject matter jurisdiction and prove it for the record or not? So I've asked Mr. Brooks twice now whether he has any witnesses to call other than himself. He has declined to answer that question. Sir, if you fail to answer that question, I will interpret your failure to answer that as a no, and uh, there you will lose the opportunity, you will forfeit the opportunity to call any other witnesses on your behalf other than yourself. So I will ask you one last time, sir, do you have any other witnesses at the courthouse available to testify right now? I'm not getting a response at all. Am I unmuted? You've been unmuted, sir. Well, me muting you doesn't affect you being able to hear the court because yes, yes, uh, that only yes, mutes your yes. audio coming into this courtroom. I confirmed already well, that I'm audio muting to begin with. the um, that is simply a misstatement. I confirmed with the bailiffs that the audio why, and visual were why working. Is my audio, why is my audio muted to begin with? because you interrupt the court repeatedly. So I'm going to ask you uh, yet another way, even though for three times now he has failed to answer this court. You indicated last week that you would like to call your mom as a witness, Dawn Woods. Um, you were provided with notice that the state would not be assisting with that in any way. You indicated when that was said that if you wanted your mom to testify, she would obey you and she would be here. So I trust that you've made arrangements for her to be here. Are you going to call Dawn Woods as a witness this morning and specifically now? I will ask him a second time. Sir, do you have Dawn Woods available to call as a witness this morning? He's been unmuted though, uh, for a while now. We can obviously hear him. I will ask Mr. Brooks a third time for the record. He's finally putting on hey. headphones. Do you, is Dawn Woods in the courthouse available to testify right now? Do you hey, intend hey, to call hey, hold her? On, hold on, hold on, hold on. For the record, Mr. Brooks only puts on the headphones when he's in the other courtroom. He does not put them on when he's in here. The audio yeah, because, and the visual work just fine in that courtroom. When I'm in the actual courtroom, I can hear it. I don't need to be muted. Mr. Brooks' statements that the audio doesn't work when I mute him is simply false. I, I can say nothing about the audio not working, so you need to stop lying on the record. I'm not lying on the record, sir. I you prefer... are lying on the record. All right, he is getting... I'm going to mute him once again because now he's raising his voice. Now he's angry. He's thrown the headphones. Um, he certainly does not seem to want to answer any of the questions this court has. I asked him three times if he had any additional witnesses to call. I warned him that if he did not answer that question, he would forfeit his right to call additional witnesses other than perhaps himself. I then specifically asked him about Don Woods because that is the person he indicated he wanted to add to his witness list last week, and I granted his request to do that. Um, I asked him twice 
Um, he did not respond to that. Uh, based upon his failure to respond, based upon this court advising him that if he failed to answer that question, um, he would forfeit his right to present any additional witnesses, again, other than perhaps himself, um, I'll find that he has forfeited his right to present and call any additional witnesses based upon his conduct in this case. Um, I would uh, direct Mr. Brooks to the case of State versus Anthony, although that squarely dealt with a person's right to call to be themselves a witness in their own case. They talk at length in that case about how rights even constitutional rights can be forfeited by conduct. Of course, the right to be present can be forfeited by conduct. That was established in Illinois versus Allen. And then the right to present evidence on your behalf can also be forfeited based upon uh, conduct. Um, although a criminal defendant does have a right to present a defense, doing so must be guided by the rules of evidence the rules of procedure, and also with respect for the dignity, order, and decorum that is needed in the courtroom. Mr. Brooks has demonstrated this morning that he is not willing to answer simple questions about calling witnesses. Um, he reverts back to raising the issue of subject matter jurisdiction, which as this court has previously found, I believe is simply a distraction tactic, a delay tactic, and a, disrupt, a disruption tactic. Um, when considering that the court must be concerned not only with the defendant's uh, right to present a defense, this court must balance that with um, preservation of dignity, order, and decorum, and the numerous procedural and evidentiary rules that control the presentation of evidence. Um, because in my findings today, uh, Mr. Brooks has been unwilling to answer simple questions regarding the calling of witnesses. Again, I'll find uh, that he has uh, forfeited his right to present further witnesses. Um, I would like to go through a number of advisements with Mr. Brooks regarding his right to testify. Um, I will unmute him for that. I ask Mr. Brooks to put on his headphones if he is unable to hear me and just to be 100% um, safe and secure on the record. I'd ask the bailiffs who are over there to advise him. I'm going to directly be speaking with him, and if he's unable to hear me, to put on the headphones at this point. He's unmuted. I've also been advised by not just the bailiffs who are over there who I can hear through the audio, but also from the clerk who's in that courtroom, through my clerk who's in this courtroom, that the audio is very loud and clear. Mr. Brooks, I would like to go through with you your right to testify and your right not to testify. We are at the stage in the proceedings where it is important that this court conduct a colloquy with you, I will advise you that if you refuse to answer my questions, refuse to acknowledge me, you can forfeit your right to testify on your own behalf. Again, that's State versus Anthony, 2015, Wisconsin, uh, 20. Mr. Brooks, you need to be aware and are so advised that you have a constitutional constitutional right to testify. Did you hear me say that? There's no response by Mr. Brooks and he does not have the headphones on and he has a book in front of him, although I haven't seen a page turn. If you testify, sir, the state has the right to cross-examine you. That means to ask you questions after you give your initial testimony. Did you hear me advise you of that? No response by Mr. Brooks. Sir, you also have a constitutional right not to testify. 
If you decide not to testify, you are further advised that doing so cannot be used against you, and I would so advise the jury. Did you hear me advise you of that? Once again, no response by Mr. Brooks. The decision to testify is for you and you alone to make. Did you hear me say that? There's no response by Mr. Brooks. It's my understanding that Mr. Brooks has the equivalent of a 12th grade education, uh, that he attended school either up to or through 12th grade, and either has a GED or an HSED. Um, there's been some conflicting information on paperwork throughout this case, but I'll find that he does have a high school education. He is currently in custody, um, of course, at the Waukesha County Jail. I'm not aware of any uh, medication that he has been taking. Sir, have you taken any medication within the last 24 hours or any drugs or any alcohol? I'm not receiving a response to that. I'm aware that he's able to read and write English. I would refer back to the record made during my colloquy with him regarding the waiver of counsel and his ability to be aware of rights, his ability to, I made a finding at that point of his understanding and based upon his conduct throughout this trial, uh, including the waiver of right to attorney hearing, I'll make a finding that he has the ability and understand he can read, write, and understand the English language. You've been unmuted the entire time, sir. So what are you talking about? Is he talking about subject matter jurisdiction and how you're going to uh, verify it on record? So he did, record? he did not answer my question if the record's not clear about whether he's had any drugs, alcohol, or medication within the last 24 hours. Um, I'll ask him, sir, has anyone made any threats against you to influence your decision on whether to testify on your behalf in this trial? Although he turned and said, what did you say? Again, I believe he's fully able to hear this court at this time based upon how the audio is functioning in the other courtroom. He did not respond to that. Has anyone made any promises yeah, to you to influence your decision? You saying. So if you can hear me, I don't hear everything you're saying, and you know I don't hear everything you're saying, so cut the crap. Um, Mr. Brooks has interrupted with very dis disrespectful words at this moment. I believe that he is feigning his inability to hear and that he's done so throughout this case. There's absolutely no indication. He puts the headphones on when he wants. He takes them off when he wants to. While in this courtroom, he hasn't had them on. He's only used them while in the other courtroom. But again, I've confirmed multiple times that the audio is loud and clear. Um, and his statements that he can't hear, his statements that when I mute his audio, that it mutes his audio are simply false. So Mr. Brooks, have unmuted. you made... Am I, still, am I still unmuted? You are, sir. And I'll make a so, record that per so the lieutenant just, over in the other courtroom, the volume is two to three to times louder than it is in this saying, courtroom. You need to stop making cross records saying that I said I can't hear you at all. I said I have trouble hearing you when I'm over here. That's what I said. So I would appreciate it if you would make the record clear and correct. Clearly, he heard me say that for him to make that distinguishing yeah, I'm statement. Sitting, I'm sitting right so, here. Don't you see me looking all up to the, to the microphone so you can hear me? I don't have or an issue you hearing you at all, right sir. Here? Can you hear me when I'm right here? I can. Once again, per the lieutenant uh, who went, who's been in both of these courtrooms, the volume in the adjacent courtroom where Mr. Brooks is at is two to three times louder than it is in this courtroom. Um, Mr. Brooks, have what you made a decision? What about this courtroom? Have you made a decision to testify in this case? No. Have you made a decision to testify? I will ask you again, sir. Have you made a decision to testify in this case? Subject matter jurisdiction. Have you made a decision to be to be impartial? To answer what your name is? 
Ashley, if you have a claim against me, I would have muted for the moment you. just because, once again, he's attempting to divert away from what this court needs to do by going through the proper colloquy with him regarding his right to testify. He is asking me about subject matter jurisdiction. He's making statements about this court that are disparaging and about my oath. Again, a clear attempt, in my opinion, to simply stall these proceedings and to disrupt them. Um, I will unmute him and I will ask him for a third time with the understanding that if he fails to answer the question in the affirmative, I will interpret his failure to respond as a no and that he is not going to testify. So once again, I am unmuting him. Sir, have you made a decision on whether to testify in this case? There's no response by Mr. Brooks. I will ask it yet another way, sir. Do you want to testify on your behalf in this case? Yes, you have been. Sir, do you want to Sir, do you want to testify in this case? You just said you was muted. So when have I become unmuted? Or or did you even mute me in the first place? Mr. Brooks, I'm asking you one last time. You do you want to nothing because you, I haven't heard nothing that you asked. Well, how are you gonna ask me something and then take and then just answer for me? Mr. Brooks, do you want you to testify? All right, I'm you going to answer. answer. I'm going to meet him again. Again, it's this it is very clear to this court that he uses the statement that I can't that he can't hear as a means to delay, it's a distraction. It's very evident that he hears this court and that he's choosing to willfully not answer this court. This court, um, as I indicated earlier, is tasked with the duty to ensure that there is efficient and effective presentation of relevant and probative evidence in this case. This court is attempting to go through the needed colloquy with Mr. Brooks, and he at all times during this colloquy has refused to answer simple questions. Um, I personally do not want to make this more difficult, but I must establish these ground rules that he must answer these questions um, in order for this court to make the appropriate findings. Without him providing answers, um, this court is left with no choice but to find that he is forfeiting his right to testify on his own behalf. Um, this court must also preserve dignity, order, and decorum. Again, ensure relevant and admissible evidence is presented and also honor the defendant's right to present a defense. Um, the simple requirement that he answer questions is required, frankly, due to the defendant's prior conduct throughout this trial, his repeated defiance, his repeated outbursts, his repeated failure to follow simple rules of courtesy and decorum, his repeated interruptions of this court, and the this court having to repeatedly remove him to the neighboring courtroom and making findings that he has forfeited his right to be present. Of course, this record is abundantly clear at this point that Mr. Brooks is not even in the main courtroom because this morning alone, he has yet to conform his conduct to the simple standards of courtesy and decorum that are required of all participants in these court proceedings, the court, the prosecutor, the defendant, the jurors, the public. Absent an adherence to these simple rules, including the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, and the rules of civility and decorum, um, and without a pledge by Mr. Brooks that he will follow these things, then on balance, this court will find that he has forfeited his right to testify. I've now made a much more full record of what is at stake, and I will give Mr. Brooks an opportunity again to go through the colloquy with the court regarding his right to testify. I am unmuting him and will attempt to go through this procedure once again. If he 
fails to answer these questions, then he is forfeiting his right to testify by his own conduct. I would acknowledge that such a procedure is certainly um, not ideal or making a finding that he is forfeited is not ideal, but it is Mr. Brooks's conduct and Mr. Brooks's conduct alone that has forced the court to make this determination. So Mr. Brooks, you are unmuted. You have been for about a minute. I want to go through the questions again. Do you, are you aware that you have a constitutional right to testify? Mr. Brooks, are you aware that you have the constitutional right to testify? Are you aware that you're practicing law from the bench? Mr. Brooks, do you understand and are aware that you have a constitutional right not to testify? I don't understand, no. Are you aware that you have a constitutional right not to testify? I don't understand and I'm not aware, so why are you asking me questions? All right, I'll do this another way, sir. Sir, you are advised that you have a constitutional right to testify and that if you choose to testify, that you would be subject to cross-examination by the state. Did you hear me say that? I didn't hear you say anything. I don't understand what you're asking. He is willfully choosing not to answer that. Sir, you are also advised that you have a constitutional right not to testify. Your Honor, with all respect, you've been trying to answer questions. Did you hear me say that? I didn't hear you ask me anything. Sir, stop talking and I'll ask it again. Sir, can you can you ask me to stop talking? I'm asking you to stop interrupting me so that you can hear the questions, even though I fully believe you hear them. I will attempt to do this one last time. All right, then let's once again, Mr. Brooks is being disrespectful. He is blurting out information. He reverts back to subject matter jurisdiction. He accuses this court of not honoring its oath. He just accused me of practicing law without a license. Again, all attempts to deflect away and mute him once again. This court has simply tried to no avail to get Mr. Brooks to ample answer simple questions, confirming on the record that he has been advised that he has a constitutional right to testify and that he also has a constitutional right to testify. I was very clear prior to unmuting him and telling him that I would go through these questions once again, that I needed him to follow the rules of decorum and civility and not interrupt this court. He has done nothing to demonstrate decorum. Again, repeated interruptions. It is, again, from my perspective, simply a tactic on his part to delay these proceedings, to disrupt these proceedings. He reverts back again to things like subject matter jurisdiction, practicing law without a license. Then he makes requests about interlocutory appeals, etc. The record is full of his tactics in this case. He would not pledge to be civil, to be courteous. He would not pledge to honor the rules of evidence or the rules of procedure. He would not even answer simple questions regarding his right to testify and whether he heard that or not. And based upon, pursuant to State v. Anthony and looking at the balancing test that this court must consider, this court simply cannot allow Mr. Brooks to get on the witness stand unfettered without an acknowledgement that he will honor the rules of procedure, that he will abide by the rules of evidence, that he will honor rulings that are made by the court. He has demonstrated repeatedly throughout this trial that when this court makes a ruling that he disagrees with, he tries to engage the court in an argument about the legal basis, even though I've provided the legal basis on the record or in the case of subject matter jurisdiction, even when there's a written determination on the issue. When looking at State v. Anthony, this is a case where the Wisconsin Supreme Court was faced with a similar situation, although not as egregious. 
as I would say here, because in State versus Anthony, that was not a case where the defendant was ever removed from the courtroom based upon his conduct. Although in State versus Anthony, they noted, it isn't a requirement to forfeit your right to testify to previous to that be removed from the courtroom. So not as egregious as a case, but this court has a history over 15 days of trial where Mr. Brooks has repeatedly been removed from the courtroom, where he has repeatedly demonstrated he has absolutely no regard for courtesy and decorum. He is what I would describe as a stubbornly defiant individual who simply wants to say what he wants, when he wants, without a filter, without regard to the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure. As State v. Anthony discussed, the right to testify, although a fundamental constitutional right grounded in personal autonomy, is not absolute. For example, there's no constitutional right to commit perjury. There's no constitutional right to present irrelevant evidence. Moreover, a criminal defendant's right to present relevant testimony is subject to reasonable restrictions. Those restrictions, again, fall primarily under the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure. The court in Anthony cited the U.S. Supreme Court from Arkansas v. Rock, where in that court stated the right to present relevant testimony is not limitless and may in appropriate cases bow to accommodate other legitimate interests in the criminal trial process. For example, numerous procedural and evidentiary rules control the presentation of evidence and do not offend the defendant's right to testify. Throughout this trial, Mr. Brooks has repeatedly accused this court of violating his First Amendment rights of free speech. I've told him repeatedly his First Amendment free speech rights are not unfettered and that they are limited in the court of law for the very reasons cited by the Supreme Court in Rock. The takeaway from Arkansas v. Rock is that a defendant may forfeit his right to testify by his conduct. Whether a criminal defendant may forfeit his or her right to testify through conduct incompatible with the assertion of a right was reviewed by that court. That court went on to discuss waiver and forfeiture and ultimately went on to conclude the following. We now conclude that the right to testify may in appropriate cases be subject to forfeiture where conduct incompatible with the assertion of the right is at issue. The balancing test that this court must go through are the interests, again, as I've already stated, for the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, civility, and decorum, and balancing all of that against Mr. Brooks' right to testify. This court is not making an arbitrary decision. The decision I make here today is, in my opinion, proportionate to the conduct demonstrated by Mr. Brooks throughout this trial and specifically today based upon his failure to even engage the court in a simple colloquy regarding his right to testify and his right not to testify. He was repeatedly warned that the failure to answer the questions would be taken by this court really as no, meaning the specific question, have you made a decision, and it's for all of those reasons that this court will make a finding he has forfeited his right to testify. With that, then, there are no other witnesses to present for the defense. Before I bring the jury out, I'll ask the state if you intend to call any rebuttal witnesses. We have no rebuttal case, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. I would like Mr. Brooks to be brought back over so that he is present in the courtroom when the court advises the jury that the defense is resting. I realize that will be over his objection. I'd ask that he honor that. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to unmute you. If you can pledge to this court that you will honor that ruling and that you won't 
challenge that directly in the presence of the jury i will bring you back over for that are you willing to make that pledge sir sir you you you're trying to you ask me a question i can't answer yeah no go ahead answer you're trying to coerce me into violating my right to remain silent how can you how can you how can you coerce me into my right to remain silent so you're not going to protect my constitutional rights because i didn't answer nothing that you uh was trying to ask me before when i had the headphones on and you can't make a decision for me you can't do that you're violating my constitutional rights sir if you'd like to testify then you need to simply go through the colloquy with this court which i've given you three opportunities to do and you have decided not to when i know you can't tell me what i decided to do because i didn't decide to do or not do anything are you willing to your honor by law you cannot coerce me i'm not coercing you sir well you you're making a decision for me based on something that i did not say myself last friday i specifically directed your attention to state versus anthony i i discussed very briefly at the end of the day on friday uh the case law that is relevant uh on these on this topic including state versus anthony rock versus arkansas and chambers versus mississippi to specifically put you on notice did you did you recall what was going on friday mr brooks i'm going to mute him again i'm i'm not going to have a debate i've made a finding i've given him yet another opportunity if he's willing to go through the colloquy with the court he wants to challenge me instead and saying he doesn't consent his lack of consent to this entire procedure is noted for the record based on his inability to pledge to this court uh, that he will honor that ruling and be respectful of the jury i'm going to leave him in the other courtroom the jury's going to be brought out um, and he will remain muted and i will simply advise them um, as i have throughout this case that he's appearing from another courtroom and that his appearance from the other courtroom should not in any way be held against him or influence their verdict in any way i will tell them that uh, there are no further witnesses for the defense and then i'll ask the state if there is any rebuttal and then the jury will be excused um, for the day because we will have a i anticipate will be a very lengthy um, discussion on jury instructions again i will advise mr brooks that if at any point in time he wants to come back over he needs to advise the bailiffs but it does need to be accompanied by uh, a pledge that he will follow the rules of civility and decorum and he will not specifically challenge the court's rulings regarding closing off of his uh, ability to call witnesses or testify on his behalf all right uh, let's have the jury brought out
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, at the moment, Mr. Brooks is appearing from another courtroom. This must not be held against him in any way and must not influence your verdict in any manner. At this time, I will advise the jury that the defense case is rested, and I'll ask the state whether there's any rebuttal evidence to present. No rebuttal, Your Honor. All right, then with that, I will declare the evidentiary phase of this trial concluded. I'm going to excuse the jury for the remainder of the day so that the parties and I uh, go through all of the jury instructions, um, and I anticipate bringing you in tomorrow morning. Um, instructions may very well take most of the day. My hope is to then have the closing arguments and then have the case be turned over to the jurors. If not, by tomorrow evening, sometime Wednesday morning or early afternoon. With that, I'll rise for the jury then. Please turn your notebooks into the civilian bailiffs. I'll get them back to you during deliberations. Thank you. Be seated. Before we begin, I will have Teresa print off what at least we do have for both parties. I'd like to take a short comfort break. Um, I'll invite Mr. Brooks to come back over, um, and then we'll start with that jury instruction conference. We'll take about 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone. We are in recess.
On the record, appearances are as they were before. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks continues to appear from the other courtroom. Um, I would like to make a record regarding the audio and visual from the other courtroom. Um, I've asked that one of the bailiffs who was present uh, during the last session, present in that courtroom, uh, come to this courtroom. I'm going to put him under oath and have him testify about the audio. I also have information from Zach Tremaine, our IT specialist. He, too, will take the witness stand. Uh, and I just want to make a full record of he did a uh, decibel reading regarding the audio as well. All right, we have De uh, Deputy Kibler. If you could take the witness stand, please. Sir, could you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? It is. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please state your first and last names for the record. First name is Nicholas, last name is Kibler, uh, first name N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S, last name K-I-B-L-E-R. Thank you. And uh, you are a Waukesha County Sheriff's Deputy? I am. And have you been assigned to work this case? I have. And were you present in courtroom uh, 20 this morning with Mr. Brooks when he was removed from this courtroom to that courtroom? I was. And did you make any personal observations regarding the audio and visual um, setup that we have over there? Both the audio and visual were working properly. The audio was a lot louder than it has been in the past while we were in that room. Did you have any difficulty hearing the court? I did not. And then, of course, you could see through the uh, cameras from this courtroom into the neighboring courtroom. I could. All right, that's the only record I wanted to make. State, have any questions? Uh, just briefly, um, Deputy Kibler, the defendant asks many asked many times if he was muted or unmuted. Do you remember that? Yes. Can you confirm that even on the occasions when his microphone was muted, the audio in the courtroom continued to work? It was. And at any time while Mr. Brooks was muted, or even if you didn't know, at any time did Mr. Brooks asked to be brought back over to this courtroom, sir. He did not. He is telling us he prefers right now to be in that courtroom. He did not want to come back in here. All right, thank you. Those are all my questions, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, you are unmuted. Do you have any questions for this deputy? No. All right, thank you. You may step down. All right, then I'm going to have Zach Tremaine also take the witness stand. Do you have <laughs> Can you do a um, project it, please? I think I can, can I just share it? Like if I share the clerk screen? Yes. All right. Um, there is, first of all, sir, stand and raise your right hand. Um, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right, thank you. Be seated. State your first and last name for the record, please. Zachary Trebane. Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Tremaine is T-R-E-M-A-I-N-E. -E. All right, and uh, what is your position with the uh, Clerk of Courts office here in Waukesha? I'm the IT coordinator for the Waukesha County Circuit Courts. Were you in courtroom 20 this morning following Mr. Brooks being uh, taken to that courtroom? Only temporarily. I was there when the call started, and then we came back to do a measurement of the DVD meter later. There's a document or a photograph that's displayed on the monitors throughout this courtroom. Can you tell me what we're looking at? So my phone is in the photo um, overlaid on top of what we call the X panel. It is our AV control panel. So you push buttons on it and actions happen into the courtroom, AV related. Um, at that time of the photo, my phone is registering 67.3 decibels in that courtroom. And that was when the judge or the court was talking and then the sound was coming over the speakers in the other courtroom. And what, if anything, based on your training and experience, can you tell me 67 decibels means? It's plenty loud. Um, for comparison, I did a quick reading in the media pooling room, which is CG6 in our courthouse. 
um, the meter there was reading between 55 and 65. So it's louder than the audio feed going to the media right now. All right, thank you. Any question um, from the state? Sir, I'm uh, looking at the photo, and Your Honor, for the record, this photo will be made a court exhibit? Yes. Okay. I'm looking at your phone screen, and it looks like in the upper right-hand corner, you. it appears the time is either 9.26 or 9.36 a.m. On my phone, yes. I believe our AV processor, which is the other time of 9.23, I believe that just needs to be updated. But okay. It is approximately 9.26 when the photo was taken. Okay. Those are my questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Do you know, happen to know what the decibels are in this room? I don't. I'd have to pull the same thing up on my phone while people are talking. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brooks, any questions for this witness? Yeah, for the record, I don't consent to being called that name. Um, do you know anything about the the hearing when someone has the hearing loss in, in, in any of their ears? I do not. So it would be fair to say you don't know if I can hear everything good from this courtroom? I can tell you what the readout of the room is. Beyond that, I don't know. Well, I can't I can see what uh, photo that everybody else is in there seeing that was supposedly supposed to be made an exhibit. I have not viewed that, so I don't know what's being referred to when you refer to the picture. I'll, I'll have to that show you done. that in a different way. I don't have the zoom up and running, which would have been the mechanism to allow for an exhibit to be displayed. I can start that and have that up momentarily. Fair enough. So give me a moment. For the moment, we'll print it in black and white so you have it until I can get the zoom up. You are in the meeting now. I need to get the other courtroom in, so just one moment. Well, I have to stop the polycom, Zach. Yep, you have to hang up and then join into the Zoom meeting. Okay, hold on, please. Can you do that? Stop the call from polycom to polycom, and then I'm going to call it in through the Zoom so I can share the screen with the exhibit, which will actually help when we do jury instructions. Copy that. Hang it up. systems are out, so hold on. One more. You are in the meeting now. All right, so the record should reflect that um, I've now changed the audio visual from the polycom unit to the use of Zoom. Um, I've called in both courtrooms and they can hear from over there and then I'll do um, 
just need to get back on so I can get the email. Give me a second, I have to go from double screen to single screen <laughs> uh, the way I sign in, but that'll take me just a second and then I'll share screen so the color exhibit can be viewed by the defendant. the court is sharing screen uh, and the image is being displayed. You see it? Okay, thank you. Any questions regarding that then, sir? Okay, thank you, sir. I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Zach. You can step down. All right, I just wanted to put that on the record since um, that was an issue raised by Mr. Brooks previously. Now, I need to get a copy of the jury instructions. They were quite lengthy. I, the record should reflect that Mr. Brooks was provided with a written copy. It's 107 pages, and the state was provided with a written copy as well. Again, it's all the same, 107 pages. And then my written copy is on its way. I accept the value and return the value of each document. That's if I'm not muted. You're not muted. I also would like to again ask the subject matter jurisdiction to prove it on the record. Your request is denied. It has yet to be verified. It has yet to be verified. Your request is noted. Your Honor, it's denied without further hearing Honor, or consideration. I was just told that. Um, the evidentiary phase is supposed to be closed. How come I haven't been able to present my evidence into the record as I've asked numerous times on the record to be able to do? I, I said I have numerous documents that needed to go into the record. Why have they not been permitted to be made evidence? I didn't, I didn't uh, rest my case. So I don't know why that's being told. And I haven't, I have yet to be able to offer my exhibits into the record for evidence. How, how is that so, Your Honor? So the court did declare the evidentiary phase of this trial closed. I specifically found that you forfeited your right to present any further evidence or testimony uh, when you failed to answer my questions regarding the calling of witnesses. And then I also declared that you forfeited your right to testify. Specifically as it relates to your trial filing, sir, I would note that all uh, evidence in a trial must be proper, it must be probative, it must be relevant, and it must follow all rules of procedure and all rules of evidence. Uh, to the extent that you wrote all of those documents, sir, that would be hearsay. And for that reason, I'm denying your request to make them part of the record. They, they were not they were not here to say, Your Honor, I did what you told me to do. You told me, since I was representing myself pro per, that I had to write everything out and present it to the court. So that's I not what that. I said. You're misquoting me, but in any event, I'm no, denying your you request. Um, I said, so you're saying that I have, so you're saying that I have no right to present evidence and to have exhibits as the state's been able to do. Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to my, have a debate about this now. Denying, I have, you, I got to mute for one second. Right? So, Mr. Brooks, I have 
muted you because um, I declared the evidentiary phase of this trial closed. You forfeited your right to present further evidence and testimony previously by refusing to answer the court's questions. I will specifically address the filings. Number one, it is not true that I advised him that any filing would become evidence. That is simply false. Number two, filings, I told him if he wanted to present motions, should be written down and should be, should be based in law and fact and request specific relief. I'm well aware that previously he has referenced he would like his filings made exhibits. I've reviewed those filings. There's nothing relevant, nothing probative, or the information contained therein is hearsay. Um, Mr. Brooks would have needed to testify regarding any statements that he, from himself, testimony. He cannot simply put in an affidavit. That's not proper. That's hearsay. Um, and he hasn't asked in any of those filings that uh, he hasn't put forth any exception to the hearsay rule that would allow this court to admit his written filings. Um, I believe, without fail, they are all irrelevant, not probative, uh, and hearsay, and therefore not admissible. So we're moving on to the discussion of jury instructions. When Mr. Brooks wants to abide by the rules of decorum and civility, um, I will unmute him. He clearly just took the entire packet of jury instructions and put them, I don't know what's under the table, if it's a garbage can or if he just simply put them under the table, but they are no longer in front of him. I will, however, unmute him so that we can get his feedback um, regarding jury instructions. It's typically a back and forth. We'll go through them um, and uh, I'll ask the parties whether there are any instructions they believe should be included and we'll have a discussion on that and then we'll talk about whether any of the instructions that are in here um, need to be modified in any way, taken out, edited, etc. Beauty. Right, you're unmuted now, but as long as but you have to not interrupt. Oh, uh, you can't you can't I'm not trying to interrupt, but how can you deny me the chance to put on the adequate defense by saying nothing that you told me to do? can be presented into evidence. So you 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 filed them, you filed everything that I gave to you, you right, filed. Mr. Brooks, I'm and going to mute you because this is not relevant at this time. It he, is. He's raised tone of voice, he's very animated, he threw the jury instructions on the floor. Um, I understand you're upset, sir. I understand you believe I'm violating your right to present a defense. I've made my rulings. I determine you forfeited your right to testify, which includes the right to present evidence as you would have testified. I closed your and I, I closed off your ability to call any other witnesses by finding that you forfeited your right to do so based upon your conduct. I understand you're frustrated. I understand you believe that uh, I'm not without authority to do that. I made specific factual findings, I've referenced the law, and you being upset with the decision is not going to change my mind. He's also taken the headphones off. It's his choice right now whether he participates in this jury instruction conference. Um, it is his choice. But if he is going to spout off about things that I've already determined, I will continue to exercise the mute function on the audio equipment. I'll unmute him again, but it, but you are advised, sir, you need to be proper, you need to not interrupt, and you need to stay on task, which is we're discussing jury instructions, not other evidence, not subject matter jurisdiction, not your belief that I told you to file things a certain way. We are now discussing jury instructions. So once again, I'll unmute him to see if he can follow these simple rules. You need to tell me why I can't present evidence. How can you deny me the fact? How can you deny me my right to present evidence? All right, I'll mute you him once you. again because he wants to continue. And again, I understand he's upset. I understand that. Um, but he has himself to blame 
for his conduct this morning and the rulings that I've made. All right, so let's go through these jury instructions. Uh, first of all, um, has the state received a copy of the draft? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brooks, do you acknowledge receipt? I believe you did by acknowledging it previously, but do you acknowledge receipt of the draft of the final jury instructions? I, I don't acknowledge nothing, and I don't, and I don't acknowledge anything now. I have not received anything. I would ask the bailiff to I pick up the documents from the floor and put them in front of him. And wait, I'm not, I don't, I'm not presenting it to nothing. I don't give my consent to. You can't deny me the right to put on a defense. How can you tell me? When I, I just say it I'm going to read it once times. again because, again, I understand he's upset. If the bailiff could confirm, well, he put him on top, he put him on the floor, that's his right. They're not in front of him, but it's by his own conduct that he's done that. The record should reflect Mr. Brooks is muted because he wants to continue to debate with this court about my prior rulings regarding his uh, forfeiture by conduct of his right to present further evidence on his behalf. I know one of the things I probably need to look at, I'm not sure if Madam Clerk did this or not, would be the language from the amendment from the amended information on count uh, 70. No, I don't want to do that. I changed. Um, 76, the 76 count, just want to make, it says near frame park, so it is in there, but that was just one question I had. All right. Um, so, state have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Your Honor, I'm just going through each one. I'm on page 50 of 107. Everything's looking great so far, though. Okay. I, fair enough, there's 107 pages. I certainly can give the parties some time to continue to read through them. Mr. Brooks is requesting to go back to his cell at this point. I'm going to deny that request. He can remain in the other courtroom. I know he's muted, but I can certainly hear him from this side. He appears to be yelling at the top of his lungs. I can't decipher what he's yelling.
I'll advise Mr. Brooks without a specific waiver of his right to be present, even if it's from the remote courtroom, he's going to remain in that courtroom. And that would require him to have a colloquy with me. Mr. Brooks, I know you are still muted by me, but I know the audio is working, but I would ask you to specifically advise if there are any specific jury instructions that you are asking be read to the jury. Mr. Brooks, if you have specific instructions or categories of instructions that you believe this court should consider, I need you to write them down on a piece of paper. If you don't have, I believe I see a writing utensil. I'm not sure if I see a pad of paper. We'll make sure you have that. But given your current demeanor, um, which is still seems quite animated and a loud raised voice, I'd ask that you write it down.
is the state doing on its review? Okay. I just want to make a continuing record that Mr. Brooks is still, I can still hear him even though he's muted due to his level, his tone of voice and volume level that he is using from the neighboring courtroom. Mr. Brooks, I'll advise you once again if there are any specific requests for either instructions or categories instructions that you want this court to consider, please write a note uh, to pass to the bailiffs who can let me know.
Thank you. I know I've, upon my review, I noted a, a few spots that uh, either in the headings that some information or words that might need to be removed. Um, but let me, why don't you go through and tell me what requests you have starting, and then we'll go page by page and just tell me what page number and what section. So I think the first concern I have is with regards to the bail jumping. I know that we had charged, there's two separate felony cases, the defendant was out on bail. And I do believe it would be assistive to the jury to have the specific case number. So when we first talking about um, 61 of 107, we start talking about the bail jumping and then we go specifically on page 63 of 107 and when we could talk about count 74 and 75 I think it might be helpful to put the, the Milwaukee case number because they are different case numbers so that they know exactly what they're finding that he was out on bail and that as conditions of his release. And those bail bonds were entered into evidence. Let me look at the The information and then just because I think this was just a, a uh, well I, I guess I'll have you um, when we look at the verdict forms on page 102 to 107 for the bail jumpings there's uh, verdicts for the bail jumpings for three separate counts 74 75 76 I don't think there should there should not be one for 76 I believe that should be the battery that would be true My computer's just acting up a bit, so I'm going to search. I'm going to see what the information says. And then I'll ask Mr. Brooks if he has a position on that. Sometimes it's easier if we just list out, I guess, what the changes are requested. I'm going to sure. make some notes, and then we'll go through sure. them one by one. But so, And I don't believe it was at, um, spelled out in the amended information. Say that again? I don't believe it was spelled out in the amended information. Right. Um, so that would be page 63 of 107, whether or not we want to put the specific case numbers. I can tell you right now, I typically like to follow the information, so I'm pro probably not inclined to do that, and we can argue that, though, to the jury. But okay. let's go through the list, and then we'll get okay. uh, the defendant's responses if he okay. would like to give us those. But we'll go through the whole list. So that's then, the bail jumping. Yep, and then... Um, with the verdict forms with regard to the bail jumping, um, just to put on the record, page 102 of 107, I believe there's a count 76 which details it as a bail jumping. I believe that should be the battery. All right. I did notice on The motive instruction was incorporated um, on page 5 of 107. And I know that intent is, is an element of the battery. I don't believe that was incorporated. I mean, usually it's a standalone instruction. I, I think the court incorporated it with the first degree intentional homicide because certainly that was 
I think that's part of the pattern instruction. Oh, it is. Okay, then we'd ask for motive. I think that there's a 175 instruction that could be given as a standalone. I'll look at that. Okay, we'll add that. And then on page 65 of 107, which is the 70, the preliminary instruction, defendant proceeding pro se. Um, there's the standard paragraph, which is the first paragraph listed under this instruction. And then there's um, an additional paragraph. Um, we are going to object to that additional paragraph. I think it highlights the defendant's bad behavior. Um, so I'd ask that that be taken out. <coughs> Okay, with regard to page 106 of 107, um, I believe that those were add-ons at the end that the court wanted to question the parties about. Yes. I, I believe that there was 325 should be given. Um, one of the witnesses for the state did testify he did have one prior conviction. I believe a witness for the defendant testified that he had a number of convictions. Um, with regard to that same page 106 of 107, instruction 141, where identification of defendant is an issue. Um, I, I don't know if it is an issue um, that wasn't raised during the defendant's closing arguments. Um, I'm sorry, his opening arguments. I would know that, uh, or note that um, the defendant would sometimes cross-examine people on if they were able to see the person driving or the description of the person driving and he would cross-examine them as to their ability to perceive that. So I guess that would really be up to the defendant if he wishes that to be given. Um, on page 107 of 107, instruction 172, um, circumstantial evidence, flight, escape, concealment, the state that was included in the initial uh, instruction that we requested and I would continue to request that instruction be included. It's really just flight, though. Correct. What's that number again? 172. Yeah, I know. It's just not there. I saw it. It's fine. But only as to flight. I made a correction on it. I'm just to find it. All right. And I would say concealment to some extent, because he took off some clothes that would have identified him. But again, his running away, his trying to conceal his identity by removing some clothing that would have been, was identified by many new, numerous witnesses as him wearing a hoodie or a light colored um, top. Those are all, and do you have any requests as it relates to <coughs> instructions that are not in the packet that should be? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right, let me turn to Mr. Brooks just to get whether he has any, his list. Um, I'm not asking for a response yet, Mr. Brooks. I'm, what I'm asking you for is whether you have any requests for jury instructions or in your review, you think anything needs to be changed, deleted, <coughs> added, etc. I know I'd ask that it be put in writing, but I'll also give you this opportunity to verbally advise the court and make your request. Do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions, sir? I would note he put two boxes right in front of where he's seated, so I can't presently see his face. I see his jacket is off because so I can see the outline of his arms and I can see the jacket on the back of his chair. Um, he is unmuted. I've confirmed previously regarding the audio working and I will just ask him a second time, sir, do you have any requests 
as relates to the draft packet of jury instructions whether that be any additions corrections edits or deletions in your honor would it be possible for the bailiffs to just move the boxes off the table so yes I think that's fair I'm gonna advise the bailiff to remove the box so I can see mr. Brooks I don't know what he's doing behind there he has quieted down he hasn't I haven't heard him in a while if you could move the second one because it can interfere with the microphone as well and the third mr. Brooks I'm going to ask you for a third time do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions any requests for instructions that are included that you believe should be included any edits or deletions from the packet that has been provided to you because I couldn't see you sir I've asked you twice now and I'll ask you a third time do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions any additions deletions edits or otherwise you don't got to talk to me like that do you have any requests related to the jury instructions sir yeah I got I got requests it ain't like they gonna be honored though as it relates to the jury instructions sir what are you what the hell you said man well mr. Brooks that was very disrespectful mr. Brooks do you have any requests do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions I understand you may be upset and I really do but I've made my determination we are I'm gonna mute him again because he's not answering the questions that I'm very clearly asking him and I've given him five opportunities mr. Brooks do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions I'll unmute you for that answer mr. Brooks I know the audio is turned up I believe you can hear me you've chosen not to put the headphones on that's your choice my final question to you do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions no then you should put the headphones on have you asked for headphones to be provided sir I believe they took them away previously because you were so agitated they were perhaps afraid you might break mr. Brooks do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions you just told me you didn't so which one is what are your requests as it relates what are your requests as it relates to the jury instructions sir
never did. Mr. Brooks, you're being disrespectful again. You've been, you been being disrespectful. You've been being disrespectful. I need to know what your position is regarding the jury instructions. And I need to know it now. What you mean? Who are you, who you, who are you talking to? I'm talking to you. I need to know whether you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions, sir. Yeah, first of all, first of all, first of all, why am I charged with two bail jumpings when I was already charged in Milwaukee for the same bail jumping? That's double jeopardy. That's not double jeopardy. Your objection is it noted. Is it's jeopardy. overruled. It, it, is, it is double jeopardy. How are you going to charge me with the same charge that I'm already charged with? You can't do that. The Fifth Amendment says, the Fifth Amendment says, that you can't place somebody in jeopardy of life and limb. Twice. I'm already charged with the same count in Milwaukee this, for the same case. It's the same bail jumping charge. So how am I charged with that here? Sir, I'm not going to provide a legal explanation other than to say I've reviewed that. Your objection is noted, um, but but the jury will be instructed regarding the bail jumping. It can't be because that's double jeopardy. Under the law, if, if, two, if two charges are identical in nature, you cannot, you cannot place me in jeopardy of life and limb twice. You can't do that. The what's your next case, the same case what's your the same what's case your request next request sir i'm case. noting your I'm, objection I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, trying, I'm trying to talk can i get it out you always want me to not interrupt you but you always find a way to talk over me i understand your position you i'm saying it's overruled you always want respect you always want respect but don't want to get it I'm charged with the same bail jumping charge here that I've already been charged with. That is double jeopardy. You can't charge me for the same exact bail jumping that I'm already charged with, that I was charged with before I even before this even came about. Sir, the bail jumping charges in Waukesha County are based upon your violating your bail while in Waukesha County by driving through the Christmas parade and allegedly killing six people and injuring 61 others. Okay. That, that's the distinction. Again, again there, there, there is no distinction. It's the same charge. It's the same it's offense. It doesn't charge. mean it's the same it's factual the same basis, sir. He is not charged is. with bail jumping with the data violation of November 21, 21 in Milwaukee County anywhere. Further, the double jeopardy prohibition would prevent him from being convicted twice, not charged twice. All right, so we've addressed that, sir. What's What other requests do you have as it relates to the jury instructions? Uh, I, I want to I know why I'm even charged twice with the same thing. You can't charge me in pursuant to a, a, a case in Milwaukee that I'm already charged with bail jumping for. I'm already charged with bail jumping for that already. So you can't, you can't essentially say, oh, well, because you were already on bail, we're going to charge you. It's a different case. date of violation, sir. The conduct yeah, for the bail jumping you know, is related to the allegation that you committed a new crime in Waukesha County while out on bond from the Milwaukee County case. Yeah, but I'm referring to the first bail jumping count, the first one. I'm not referring to both of them. I'm referring to one of them. My understanding, sir, is there's different dates of violations as it relates to that. So I've noted your objection now repeatedly. I understand it. Your request to, I guess, dismiss the bail jumping counts are denied. I didn't say nothing about counts. I said one. Whether it's one not, count or both, it's being, denied. Am I not being understood? You can't charge me with the same charge twice. You can't. It's two separate of. Uh, cases, sir. There's two. Is it that, that 971.23? Is it that the statute? Is it that the statute? That refers to the double. All right, sir. I'm not going to have an argument. Five. This isn't fruitful. I, you're, I understand what you're saying. You're saying you, there shouldn't be two counts of bail jumping. You believe it's double it jeopardy. Be I so disagree with that. There's I'm separate. Already charged with it 
I'm already charged with it, though. We're, this is a circular argument, it sir. It doesn't change the fact that, from my perspective, the two bail jumping counts are going to proceed forward. There's been sufficient evidence presented to warrant the jury being instructed. They can't. What other, can't. what but other, what other requests do you have, sir? Don't talk over me. Don't, don't, don't talk over me. Just like you don't want me to talk over you. Just like you don't want me to talk over you. Just like you don't want Mr. Me to Brooks, me. what you other you requests you do you have? And I just asked you, I just asked you not to talk over me. You've been making your record the whole time you've been over this. You had me muted. I didn't see no, I didn't see no request over there. I didn't write nothing to go over this. I let you do what you was doing. No matter how egregious and biased it is, I'll let you do what you was doing. Because we both know that what you're doing is not right. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to refocus your attention to the jury instructions. All of your objections are noted. I understand that. If you can't answer my question, I'm going to move on. You can't. I haven't given you consent. All right. I'm going to mute him once again. He refuses to answer simple questions regarding the if he has any requests. He just made an argument regarding the bail jumping. So clearly he has an understanding about the law as it relates to that. It may be a mis misunderstanding about the law and double jeopardy. But he made a an argument. I've denied it. I'd like to know if he has any other requests. If he can stay on topic, I'll unmute and mute. I will unmute him again and he can tell me the list just like the state went through a list. I need to get through their list. I'm asking you to list out all your requests and then I will take each one up in turn. So here is your opportunity to give me your other requests, not debate with me about prior rulings. Go ahead, Mr. Brooks. Don't 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 sit up here and try to play no game talking about you giving somebody an opportunity that you haven't gave me an opportunity to properly defend myself and put put evidence, put substance to evidence, which I've asked you repeatedly to do before we even got to the trial. You told me we wasn't in the evidentiary phase. Mr. Brooks, do you have any other requests as it relates to the jury instructions? This is probably the tenth or so time I've asked you this question. No, no it's not. No, it's not. So please stop being incorrect, Your Honor. Please, please stop. Please do you stop. have any additional requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Yes. Oh. That, that first uh, count 74 bill jumping needs to be dismissed. You can't charge me with two things. You can't charge me with the same charge twice. All right, I've made a note of that. What's the next either, issue? Either one county gonna charge you with it or y'all, but it can't be both. It's the same, it's pursuant to the same exact thing that I was gonna bill for. The same exact thing, the same exact case. So why are we giving the jury instructions on two cases from another county? I've made a and note of that. What other what other requests do you have? Man, this is ridiculous. So I'm not I'm not I'm not even able. I'm not even able to adequately defend myself, present evidence, do anything, because everything I say is going to be found a reason for it not to be done. What are we doing here, Your Honor? What, what, what is the Mr. Brooks. Why should I be here when the I've made a note of your request as to count 74. Do you have any other requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Why are we why are we even having jury instructions? Why do I gotta why do I have to even sit here in this courtroom at this point? Because everything you've been doing, you've been doing without my consent anyway. So you're gonna find a way to do this without my consent. So why do I need to be here for your objection for lack of consent is noted for the record. Okay, yeah. Any you, any you, other you, requests, you sir? You talk a good game. You talk a good game to save yourself enough space. But everything I put up and have no merit in your court. None. All right. I've asked him many, many, many times. I've advised him and I'll advise him once again. If he fails to answer the question, I'm moving on. Do you have any other requests as it relates to the jury instructions, sir? You can't, you can't move on because I haven't given you consent to. All right. He 
did not answer. So I'm muting him again. I The only request that he has made as it relates to the jury instructions as he pounded his fists once again, raised his voice. Um, I understand, I really do, that he's upset with my decision to cut off his ability to present a defense, but that decision was made based on his conduct and his conduct alone, as I've outlined already on the record. Um, so the only request that he made uh, at, was as it relates to the bail jumping counts, um, I'm denying those requests, whether it be to dismiss one count or to dismiss both on double jeopardy um, or to just not instruct the jury. Um, however way I interpret it, I'm denying that. All right, let me go through the state's can I add one more? Sure. I'm sorry. 154 summary of evidence. I believe we had a map, um, actually two maps that summarize the, um, we had three maps, I think. The one was summarized his, his route, the path that he took. The other one summarized the victims who were struck in the specific locations. And the other one summarized the positions of the law enforcement officers at the various intersections and throughout the parade routes. I'll make a note of that. We also, I don't believe I saw the jury view instruction either. I don't, I mean, that was given to them at the time. I don't know that it needs to be reread, but I think we need to consider that as well. And that was my version of 152. All right, so let me go through uh, the list from the state. Turning to page 61. So I've considered the request by the state. Um, I am going to rely on what information they put in the charging document. I'm going to deny the request to include the specific case numbers. Um, there's evidence, of course, that was received regarding the two separate cases out of Milwaukee County uh, that form the basis for both of the bail jumping counts. It will be up to the jury to review the evidence and make a determination as to the verdict forms, though, that were referenced previously, at least the description of them in the jury instructions that um, Obviously, the third account of bail jumping is incorrect. That needs to be battery, and that change will be made. I'm also having Madam Clerk include all of the numbers for the jury instructions when they go back, so it's very clear. Some of them did not have them on, just frankly, from prior cases that she and I have worked on. But in this case, I want to be very clear with all of the numbers. Um, so I think I've addressed the first two bullet points. As far as the motive instruction as a standalone, I believe that is appropriate. And I'll instruct Madam Clerk to include that. As far as where it goes, I'm gonna just, in, uh, any instructions that we add should just be in the numerical order, unless we, unless there's a other request that's made. Then the state also made a request as it relates to jury instruction 70, which is found on page 65. So as it relates to this, the state is asking that I simply um, instruct the jury based on the pattern instruction and not include the more that second paragraph i had previously advised the jury with another paragraph that i was contemplating including even if i took out that big paragraph that just said at times mr brooks has appeared from another courtroom this must not influence your verdict in any manner what's the state's position on including that but taking out the paragraph you request to be taken out it's fine. Mr. Brooks, do you have any position on that? Which is, uh, so jury instruction 70 has to do with the defendant proceeding pro se. The pattern instruction would be basically the first paragraph. It's, I need the bailiffs to move the boxes away from his face. I need to be able to see him. He can keep them on the table, but they need to be moved off to the side. And if he does it one more time, then I will instruct the bailiffs to take the boxes away. Those are trial prep materials. 
Um, if there's something in those materials related to jury instructions, he's in, he should take those out now. Otherwise, they need to be moved away from the microphones and away from, from blocking his face. I'm not putting them here. I'm not putting them here. She's saying to me, I'm putting them here for a reason. I'm not letting her in any seat. Mr. Brooks, do you have any position on the verbiage of jury instruction no, 70 me, on page no 65? Don't ask me no question. Are you, are you my accuser? Are you my accuser, Your Honor? All right, he's choosing not to answer, so I'll mute him again. It's unfortunate that he's deciding not to participate in this. Um, I agree with the state. I don't need to highlight with that second paragraph. I will take that out, but I will include in the paragraph that reads, at times, comma, Mr. Brooks has appeared from another courtroom, period. This must not influence your verdict in any manner. <laughs> Inclusion of the instructions that were put on the last couple of pages um, include 325 impeachment of witness its prior conviction the part about juvenile adjudication should be struck from the heading and it should read evidence has be, has been received that one or more witness in this trial has been convicted of a crime there were two witnesses that was applicable to the remainder will be as is and that was one witness for the state, one witness for the defense. I just will add that if Mr. Brooks has any position about these requests, he should, um, he is currently muted. He can uh, raise his hand and I'll unmute. Otherwise he can pass a note to the bailiff or simply tell the bailiff who can then tell me and I can unmute him. But unless he tells me then I'm gonna assume he's made a decision not to provide further comment based upon the last statement he made to me. Then 141, um, I am, I believe that's appropriate given the evidence that has been received that's on identification of defendant is in issue. Um, and uh, that I will instruct the jury accordingly unless there's a request from Mr. Brooks to take that out. Is there a request from you, sir, to take 141 out? I'll unmute for that purpose. That's, it's found on page 106 because it's at the end of the instructions. This is the instruction on identification of the defendant and where it's at issue in a case. I believe it's appropriate given the testimony in this case. Do you have any position on that, sir? You are unmuted, so you can simply answer yes or no. No response. Then uh, 172, circumstantial evidence, flight, concealment, I believe is appropriate given the evidence that has been received Am I during this case. Yes, sir? Am I you have been. Am I unmuted? You are. So, how long before you mute? As soon as I say something? Depends on what you say, how you say it, and if it's responsive to what we're doing. Why do I have to be responsive to what, to what you guys are doing? Nothing, okay. nothing I say even matters at this point. So what's the point of me being responsive? You can't make decisions for me. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to mute you unless you can participate in what we're doing, which is discussing the jury instructions. I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm going to tell the jury the truth. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell them what hasn't been told to me. I been Mr. To Brooks, as a, I'm going to mute you because we're trying to discuss the jury instructions, not what you're going to say during your closing argument. I will get to that later. In terms of uh, instruction 172, I'll instruct Madam Clerk to take out of the heading the word escape. Should just say flight concealment. Um, and then I've reviewed 154. I believe that's appropriate. I'm going to pull it up just as a draft. I'm not sure if there's anything that needs to be. Okay. 
So the pattern instruction talks about a chart. Is there any request from the state as to just keep that or modify that in any way based upon the evidence that was presented? Because you actually submitted maps and things were received. I don't know that summary. I think that there was a summary of the victims and the associated counts. I believe that that was exhibit <coughs> 141. But that was received, wasn't it? And there were some charts of the um, extreme dance team, the formation, and dancing right. grannies. Do you have all the exhibit list, Madam Clerk? What are those numbers again? I wrote 141. Um, we're just looking for the extreme dance and fancy granny chart. Grannies is 54. 54 would be the dancing grannies. Okay. And 33 is the extreme dance team. So 54, 141, and 33? Yes. Do you think the use of the word chart is correct, or should that be? I would say diagram and maps. Um, the court has allowed the use of diagrams and maps to organize the evidence. The maps were evidence, though. What this instruction says is the court has allowed the use of a chart to organize the evidence and to assist you in understanding it. The chart itself is not evidence. It is a summary of some of the evidence that was permitted <laughs> or presented. However, it is the evidence that controls. You should rely on the chart only to the extent that you believe it accurately and properly summarizes the evidence. Then we think 154 should not be given. That's what I was wondering. Because so they were all admitted. They were all admitted based upon how they were presented and the I testimony apologize. regarding them. Typically, where that comes in is for use in openings and closings solely that are based upon evidence, and we anticipate those things coming in, not when there's been an actual document that's been admitted. So I don't think 154 is needed, and I'll deny that request. What about uh, 152 regarding the view? Governor, as I read that, that was given prior to the view, and I think that was appropriately given at that time. I don't believe it goes into the closing instru or the um, final instructions. That was my, my inclination, but I wanted to get the party's position on that. I'll once again unmute Mr. Brooks and just ask him if he has any position regarding any of these last issues that we've discussed with as it relates to the jury instructions. Anything from you, sir, on the jury instructions? He's not responding to the question. I believe that covers all of the issues that were raised by the parties then. Um, you are. I'll give you one final opportunity to tell me if you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions, sir. What you hear you give me one final thing. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to present them yet. This all been talking about. And I say y'all because I haven't been participating in none of that. I understand, I sir. Your objection's going. noted. Your lack of consent is noted. Okay, I don't see what's going on in here. So how is decisions being made without me being able to consent to it? Sir, you forfeited your right to be present in this courtroom by your conduct, and you have not requested no, actually, to come back. Actually, actually, you took a, a break. So let's let's make sure the record is correct. You took a ten-minute break. I did. At which time? At which time I was brought back into this courtroom? I was advised you wanted to stay, sir. Okay, and you you you've been you've been uh forcing me to come over here from the get-go, why couldn't you force me to come back over here where I'm supposed to be at? 
Sir, you, my understanding is you requested to stay in the other courtroom. I thought I put that on the record at the beginning. If I did not, I'll put make that part of the record now. I was advised by the bailiffs that you were requesting to stay in that courtroom. I certainly advised you prior to that that if there was a time you wanted to come back in, all you needed to do was ask. You've done that previously. Yeah, but and during, and even... Even during this time, though, you've been incredibly disruptive during, I mean, at one point you were muted for an extended period of time and you were yelling so loud, sir, um, we could hear you in this courtroom. I couldn't decipher what you were saying and I was also made aware that another branch could hear you. So you were, you continued okay, your disruptive fine. behavior. That's fine because at the end of the day, I should be heard. I have this first amendment right to be heard. So if I'm going to be constantly muted, the only way for me to be heard is for me to raise my voice. Mr. Brooks, one final time, do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Oh, Otherwise, I'm going to approve them. I'm going to take a break, and then we'll uh, come back in the afternoon to go over verdict forms. I didn't answer yes or no, so how do you consent to anything without me answering the question? Are you, you going to answer the question, sir? You can't, but you can't force me to do it. You can't. You can't just say, I'm going to do this. Sir, but you also this. can't stall the proceedings by failing to answer. I didn't, I didn't try to stall the proceedings. You're the one that held me in contempt. I never you held you in contempt. contempt. All right, you I'm going to mute him once again because he refuses to answer a very simple question uh, about whether he has any requests as it relates to the jury instructions. I will work on making all the changes with Madam Clerk, finalizing the order, print them off again, um, she has been working on the verdict forms, which are, of course, separate, which need to be approved by this court. So those will be printed off. A set will be provided to the state. A set will be provided to Mr. Brooks. We'll take an, uh, I'll do a 90-minute lunch break. So it's roughly, it's 1127. <coughs> so we'll come back at 1 o'clock uh, to finalize the verdicts and the jury instructions. And Your Honor, with regard to, to sequestration of the jurors and the alternates and those issues, did you want to address those this afternoon? Yes. Okay. We can do that. Thank you. They, I, I can put on the record that I had the civilian jury bailiffs provide the parties. We have a letter regarding sequestration. There's an emergency contact form. So all of the jurors were made aware of that. Um, they know that. Um, of course, once the case is, the, all of the instructions are read and the parties make their arguments and then there's some final instructions at the end and the case goes to the jury, um, obviously only 12 of the 15 will be deliberating, uh, but we can make a more full record of that this afternoon. Thank you. All right, we are in recess until one o'clock. Um, I'm just instructing the parties to stay until the handout of the verdict and then you can leave for lunch. Thank you.
we are back on the record. It is uh, 101 p.m. State versus Brooks. Appearances are as they were before. I would note I have instructed and Mr. Brooks is present in this courtroom. Prior to the, I understand your objections. If you would like to go back to the other courtroom, sir, you may, but that is a choice that you would be making. I am not requiring you. I'm not forcing you at this time. So you're not holding me in contempt? Sir, I am not requiring you or forcing you to go into the other courtroom. It is a new part of the day. I thought it appropriate to have you brought here. Why? And only if you forfeit your right by conduct will I put you back in the other room. So you're going to address subject matter jurisdiction for the record? Are you going to state it on the record? I'm declining to address that on the record for the reasons I've previously provided to you, not the least of which is I have addressed that by way of a written decision. And it, and it hasn't been proven for the record. You Your objection is noted. Record. Can I go back in the other courtroom? Because I'm, I'm not going to do this with you. I'm not. Mr. Brooks, I do want to go over we don't the have, jury instructions. I don't, I don't understand the, the jury instructions. I don't understand anything that's in these proceedings, and I'm not going to participate in, in something that I don't understand. That's your choice, sir. May I please go back into the other courtroom? You can. Based upon your choice and your request, I'll make a finding that he's uh, forfeiting his right to be present in this I didn't forfeit courtroom. anything. I asked. I understand you, Sorry, asked, but I, I feel it's important anything. to also make a finding based upon your conduct. <clears throat> based upon what conduct? Me asking? Are you willing to expressly waive that right on the record right I'm now? Gonna, I'm not going to expressively waive anything. Are you willing to I'm, I'm engage in a colloquy regarding your right to be present I in a not. knowing and intelligent and voluntary waiver of that right? I am not going to consent to anything that I don't understand, and I will not answer any questions that I don't understand. I'm merely making a request to not be present in these proceedings. And to be in the other courtroom? Again, as I've stated numerous times now for the record, I will not answer or comply with anything I do not understand. I'm not making a voluntary wavery of anything. Are you willing to be, let me rephrase that. Um, if I have you stay in this courtroom, are you willing to follow the rules of decorum and courtesy? I do not understand the question you are asking. Are you willing to not interrupt the proceedings with disruptive behavior? I do not understand the questions that you are asking. Well, given that he won't answer the questions directly, for now he is to remain in this courtroom. I'm requesting to not be in this courtroom. But you won't go through, you won't answer my questions regarding that, sir. I did. I, I told you I don't understand. That's not answering the question, sir. You asked me a question, I answered it. I don't understand. How can I ask, how can I answer something that I do not understand, Your Honor? All right. Uh, let me start with... The jury instruction is start with, one I would start like with subject to. matter jurisdiction? No, I've declined that already, sir. I'm not going to address under that what law? Under what lawful law? Sir, please do not interrupt me again with the topic of subject matter jurisdiction or um, you run the risk of forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom. Then let me go into other courtroom then. Are you willing to engage in a discussion about that, sir? I need to make an just, appropriate record. I just told you that I don't understand the questions you're asking. What do you want me to do? I can't answer something I don't understand. I believe you're choosing not to answer that. You can sir. believe what you want to believe. I, I believe that you hide the stuff from the jury. I believe you won't. You're, you haven't been impartial or fair. You haven't let me even enter anything into evidence, which is my right to do so. Your but it doesn't matter what we believe, sir. Your Honor. I'm, I'm merely stating a request to not be present for these proceedings. I cannot answer 
the Sir, questions you are asking me because I don't me understand them. You understand your right to be present in the courtroom. Are you telling me you I don't, don't understand, understand anything? Right? I don't. I do. Nope. I don't understand. Nope. Then you're gonna stay here. For now. And under what lawful law? You can't for you can't force me to stay somewhere that I'm making a request not to. You can't you can't make me understand. You can't make me. You can't force me to understand what I don't understand. You can't force that. I need to address one of the jury instructions, number 315. So, Your Honor, I'm trying to make a request to not be present in these matters without disrupting the courtroom, as you say that I do, and over-talking you, as you state that I do. I'm making a request merely to not be present for these proceedings. Obviously, I'm not needed because every decision that's been made here today has been made without my consent. That's clearly telling me that I'm not needed. I have never consented to anything that's going on here today. I haven't even been allowed to present any evidence, which is something that I stated weeks ago. Weeks. You already knew, Your Honor, that I wanted things to present into evidence. I've asked numerous times for that and have been denied. And, and I don't understand why, why I'm not being able to adequately defend myself. You're, in your words, you're not being allowed to adequately defend yourself based upon your conduct in this courtroom and throughout these proceedings and your unwillingness to follow the simple rules of decorum, courtesy, um, procedure, rules of evidence. You refuse to answer a variety of questions this morning when this court went through the uh, or attempted to go through the colloquy with you regarding your right to testify and your right not to testify. And because of that, and be, based on the case law that I cited this morning, I made a finding that you forfeited your right to present further testimony and evidence through other witnesses, and then you forfeited your right to testify in your behalf. I'm not going to revisit those, sir. I'm not asking you to revisit them, but I'm just, they're, they, weren't, they weren't correct. I understand you will because I, with I never that. consented to it and I never answered something. I understand and you I just stated the reason that. why I didn't answer because I don't understand. You cannot force me to understand what you're asking me. Sir, I could not even get through the advisement. You wouldn't even listen. You talked over me repeatedly. Was that from the other courtroom or in here? Because I've been over there all morning. To the place that you are requesting to go back to, right? You you sent me into the other courtroom. You're right, I did. Right. So I've been over there all morning. With an adequate audio and visual system I connecting mean, the two courtrooms. Your, the functional your, equivalent to of your equivalent in this to your equivalent is adequate. But to mine it's not. Seeing as how you always state Illinois versus Allen. You always state that. You always state that. But it never it never refers to a fourth option that you refer to. It never Mr. refers Gross, to I'm not going to debate this with you. If you continue to bring up subject matter jurisdiction, Illinois I didn't bring Allen, up subject the matter decisions jurisdiction. that I made earlier. I'm trying to figure out why I'm being held in contempt. You are frustrating the purposes of this hearing I'm trying to right figure now, out why I'm being held in contempt. Which is to finalize the jury instruction I, and the verdict forms. Your Honor, I'm merely trying to understand why I went. You hold me in contempt. I never held you in contempt, sir. You, you attempted to. Nope. You've never attempted to hold me in, in contempt. No, sir. There. I again. I'm not going to revisit all of these issues. When I asked you where you hold me in contempt, you said civil. Are you going to respect civil. the decisions that I've made? They're they're not by they're not interrupting. They're not correct decisions, Your Honor. I understand that. You'll. Have I can't to... answer. You asked me questions. You asked me questions. I didn't answer them based on my understanding. How can you force me to understand what you're asking me if I don't? And then you and then you still make a finding based on that. How how is that lawful law? Mr. Brooks, I stand behind the record that I've made today. And that's fine. I'm not just I'm not, I'm advising I'm not you arguing with you about what you ruled. I'm saying how me. can you do that without my consent? If you continue to raise issues that I've that's, already That's addressed. a violation of my civil rights. If you continue to raise these issues, sir, and thwart the purpose of this court, which is to finalize the jury instruction and the verdict forms, you will forfeit your right to be present in the courtroom, and you will appear from the other courtroom. Okay. Absent, you, I and know you've requested I just, to I be just there. Made a, I made a request for the moment we walked in here to not be present for these proceedings, but yet but you still. you also won't uh, 
have a dialogue with me about your be understanding because of it's what my that it's means. my fifth amendment right i'm exercising my rights that i reserved from the moment we walked in here this morning you can't for you can't force that you can't force me you can't force me to do anything actually no you're right but i can make certain findings you, that you forfeit rights you that can't you have and, based, and, upon and your based on what lawful law you're under I cited the law this morning. All right, I am Illinois on. versus Allen, right? I am that I can on. be present from another courtroom. I if need to I discuss forfeit my right, instruction three one five. Um, Your Honor, I, I don't. I don't understand. Language needs to be modified based upon the court's earlier ruling today. I don't understand. I don't understand the proceedings, and I think that should be stated for the record. If I'm telling you repeatedly, Your Honor, that I don't understand. You can't force me to understand. That's a violation of my of my constitutional rights to try to force something upon me. That's coercion, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Brooks, I completely disagree with your characterization of the proceedings this morning. While it is true that you did not provide consent, you were you were entirely uncooperative with court this morning. That's because I didn't and, understand. I'm explaining why, Your Honor. I'm not. I'm not trying to leave it where it was at. I'm attempting to, to answer the questions. I'm attempting to. So to I'm going to explain myself of why I did not answer. It was because the the way that you're making it seem is that I intentionally didn't want to answer, and that's Mr. not Brooks, fair. I'm, I'm moving on to instruction three fifteen. Uh, and I'm gonna still I still don't understand. So what, so how can we even proceed? Mr. Brooks if I'm telling do you, you I don't understand, understand what that I'm asking you to be No playing? I don't. No. I Mr. don't Mr. Brooks, please stop it. And for the record me. I don't consent to being called that name. You clearly right. hear me, sir, because if you didn't hear me, then you wouldn't make that statement. Hearing so and understanding hear is two different things. I know you can hear me, sir. I'm asking Hearing you and to stop interrupting me. Things. I'm not trying to interrupt you, but you're, you're going to, at some point, you're going to ask me my opinion of what's going on. And then when I tell you I don't understand, it's going to be taken as me trying to delay or trying if to do this or trying talking, to do that. I will explain why I'm bringing up instruction 315. And I'm not going to understand your explanation. Well, you can't say that if you haven't heard what I have to say. Didn't you try to do this earlier before lunch? But I need to clarify something because 315, which is the instruction that has the, it's titled, Defendant Elects Not to Testify. I had it in there. However, that instruction should really only be given if requested by the defendant. There has been no request made. And obviously this court made a finding that he forfeited his right to testify. Oh. And absent Mr. Brooks requesting that instruction to be in, I believe it would not be proper for this court to include 315 in the instructions to the jury. Does the state have any position on that? Your Honor, I did look at the notes that are associated with instruction 315, and I would agree. All right. Mr. Brooks, do you have any position on whether this court should include instruction 315 uh, in the jury instructions to the jury? I don't even understand what 315 jury instruction is. It's entitled Defendant Elects Not to Testify. I'll read it for you. It's, it's my notes, meaning my uh, materials, my um, jury instruction book says to be given only if requested by a defendant, and it reads as follows. This is the actual language of the instruction. A defendant in a criminal case has the absolute constitutional right not to testify the defendant's decision not to testify must not be considered by you in any way and must not influence your verdict in any manner. So my question is, do you want this instruction read or modified in any way? You just said I got a constitutional right not to testify or to testify. I didn't make either one of those decisions, so I don't understand. The what jury you're instruction is typically read when a defendant does not testify. In every other case that I've had, the decision on whether to testify was a decision made by the defendant personally. In this case, the court found that you forfeited your right to testify based upon your conduct. That is the ruling I made this morning. How, how did I make that decision, though? I didn't, My I didn't question never to you say yes is, or no. I never do you yes want no. the jury instructed that your silence must not be considered by them in any way and must not influence their verdict in any manner. What do you mean my silence, my Fifth Amendment right? Correct. 
I, I'm not hearing a request from you to have the jury and because I don't, this instruction. I don't understand why you're asking me the question, Your Honor. I never, I never decided to or not to testify. I, I never decided that, either sir. way. I understand that. So how can I answer that? I, I don't understand why. I don't understand. We are now at the moment where we are discussing whether the jury should receive an instruction specifically on you not testifying, irrespective of the reason for that. I believe I could modify this instruction to simply say a defendant's silence or a defendant not testifying should not be considered by the jury in any way and must not influence their verdict in any manner. Are you making such a request for a modified instruction? I don't understand the question because I never decided to or not to testify. I understand. I understand what you're saying, sir. I really do. But in light of the court's decision that you forfeited your right to testify, how did I forfeit something I never said? Do you want the jury to be instructed something to the effect of they cannot use your silence, meaning they cannot use you not testifying against you in any way? I don't understand because I never made a decision not to or to testify. I'll ask you one more time, and if you do not answer with a yes or no, I will take your answer of not answering as you are not making a request for a modified instruction. How can you do that, Your Honor? Do you want this court, sir, to instruct the jury in any way regarding you not testifying in this case? I don't understand the question. All right. Then based upon there has not been an express request made by Mr. Brooks to give either 315 as it's in the standard or pattern jury instruction or a modification as this court has suggested, 315 is to be taken out of the jury instructions. How are all these decisions being made without me understanding? Then I have looked over the verdict forms, and other than really what I would describe as some consistency in how phrases, whether there's all caps, not all caps, but what we call the sentence capitalization for the charges. For example, I want to be consistent with how I spell out first degree intentional homicide or first degree recklessly endangering safety. There was just some, sometimes it was capitalized, sometimes it wasn't. So we're looking through all of that to be consistent. I want to make sure the word information is capitalized since that's the charging document, things of that nature. It is my practice, and you should be aware, Mr. Brooks, that I always put the not guilty verdicts on top when I hand all the verdict forms to the jury. And by that I mean it's by charge. So they're collated, if you will. So the not guilty followed by the guilty for counts 1 through 76. You said it's collated. What do that mean? So I put the not guilty, then the guilty for count 1, followed by the not guilty and the guilty for count 2, and so on and so forth, all the way through the remainder of the counts that are alleged in this case, which in this case total 76. I don't understand. So how? I looked at the special questions that are on the guilty verdicts only. They did appear to be proper. Again, just some grammatical things, but I believe those are all accurate. Can I go to the other courtroom? Since you don't have to answer any questions, but I have to answer all, can I just go to the other courtroom? Not at this time. Why not? I keep telling you I don't understand these proceedings, and you just keep running right over my rights like you don't even hear me saying anything. Attorney Basey, are you handling the verdict forms? Go ahead. Can I go to the other courtroom, please? Are you waiving your right to be present in this courtroom? I'm not waiving anything. Then the answer is no. I'm making a request. Then the answer is no. Then how is it? So what? You're going to try to force me to interrupt and do all this so you can make the record and make it seem like I forfeited something? That I came in here as soon as we got on the record and made a request to not be present for these proceedings. But when I'm making a request to avoid the drama and all that. Sir, the only one with the drama is you. It's you, too. You're the big contributor to the whole thing. Mr. Brooks, I have to preside over this case. Yeah, and you haven't been impartial or fair yet. 
Mr. Brooks, I have a question to the state. I ask that you not interrupt. And it's it's not about me interrupting. It's about me attempting to understand. I've been saying that since we came in here. Mr. Brooks, I will, you can't, you I will can't respond force me as to understand. To that. You waived your right to counsel. I didn't waive my right to no counsel. I you gave you the contract. Right. I did not. And you won't sit here and, and say that for the record because that is not no, what happened. No, you have, you are no. incorrect. So we don't have, the, do we have the paperwork? Because I believe that I gave you the paperwork back that you. Mr. Brooks, you very. I gave it to you, altered. Clearly. And did not waive it. Have been presenting a nuanced argument regarding that, that the right to true, counsel that is versus true. the right to assistance of counsel. That is not true. That's a pretty sophisticated argument. That's why I believe you fully understand what's I going don't. on in this courtroom. I don't fully understand. I disagree with your characterization I with your of the right to counsel. You know that you accepted you the way that I gave it to the you. Entirety. So you shouldn't have did that if you if you had questions of me not understanding. I don't have any questions whatsoever. You definitely sir. do because I'm telling you right now I don't understand and you still won't even acknowledge the fact that I'm saying in open court on the record that I don't understand something. I haven't waived anything. You made decisions today that I didn't consent to, that I explained I did not answer because I didn't understand. Which is my right to say that. Right, Mr. Brooks, you it's are also interfering my with the right proper and silent. orderly administration of these proceedings. Um, I understand that you disagree with the decisions that I have made, but you aren't respectful of the decisions. You keep wanting to debate them and argue them. That is not the proper legal recourse at this time. I have asked you if you're willing to waive your right to be present. You indicated you're, you're not. Because and yet you continue to interrupt. You said wave. I'm not waving anything. Then that's why you're here until I make a finding that you, by your conduct, are forfeiting your right to be present. Well, make the finding and kick me out. Make the finding and hold me in contempt, which is what you're waiting to do anyway. That's why that courtroom is set up the way it has for the whole time, because at some point it's anticipated that I will be over there. Which is, which is not impartial and which is biased is judicial misconduct I stated from the beginning sir that the goals of this trial so you reading from the paper or are you reading for, or are you just citing which number you know? one sir is is during the evidentiary phase of this was to control the presentation of evidence so as to ensure fairness and reliability of the criminal trial process. And I offer that evidence that you didn't allow. Developing relevant facts upon which a determination of guilt or innocence can be made. What is sometimes referred to in the case law as the ascertainment of truth. There's an equal but secondary purpose related to efficiency and effectiveness. That has been my repeated use of 90611 uh, is what that would fall under. There's a third goal of everything that I've done here, and that is uh, the courtesy and decorum in this courtroom, what I've sometimes referred to as civility. Of course, there are other goals as well, including protecting your rights, protecting the record, protecting the jurors. How have my rights been protected, Your Honor, if I can't even put evidence into Disagreement with the court I can't even make evidence. decisions, sir. Yeah, but... How can, in I, a, how in, can I defend myself if I can't even present evidence? But, sir, you have not been willing to follow the rules of civility but and decorum this entire... But that doesn't have anything to do with my evidence. It has everything. I could have did that from the other courtroom, too, correct? Sir, you... If I can be present conduct, from the other courtroom, I should be able to present evidence from the other courtroom as well. And you, by your conduct this morning, sir, I'm not saying, willing to I'm answer saying, the most saying, basic of totality, questions the totality, about whether right. you... The totality. Have I, not asked to, have I not asked, in fairness, have I not asked to admit evidence? Have I not asked more than once? Mr. Brooks, you have not asked to present any evidence. Yes, I have. You told me we weren't at the evidentiary phase. Manner. How would I know that if, 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 you, didn't, if you didn't ask and me, you, ask the question? And you, as your own attorney, you proceed at your own peril sometimes. That Whether has you have a full understanding of the rules evidence. of procedure and rules of evidence, or not. And that I has made nothing that to do with me being clear. able to present evidence. So, 
Mr. Brooks. Nothing I, this is nothing your I final presented warning. have been able to be admitted into I'm evidence. I'm turning to the state for a discussion of the verdict forms. If you interrupt me or them again, then I will make a finding that you forfeited your make right the to finding. be present. Make the finding. And you will appear from the neighboring courtroom. You want me to appear from the neighboring courtroom? Just, just, let's just, I don't. Just let me go. Attorney Basie, go ahead. Just let me go. I felt that all the verdict forms looked um, good. I did ask your clerk. All right, he's interrupted. He's forfeited his right to be here. He's chosen to do that despite the warning from the court. Will be there wasn't no warning. I, I'm the one that asked. Over. So let's to the let's other make court the record correct. I'm the one that asked when we came in here. Your and right. video working appropriately. I asked, I asked when we came in here Madam to be clerk, present for the to other do court. It by Zoom because we may have to utilize the share screen in order. We don't have to utilize no share screen because I'm not going to participate in no proceedings that I don't understand. The documents. I told you I don't understand. We're a in million times. Until we get the courtroom set up. No, we we don't have to be in recess. I don't agree to it.
Mr. Brooks is now appearing from the other courtroom. Appears he has headphones on. Speaking of headphones, I do need to make a correction to the record from this morning. I had made a statement that given his demeanor, the headphones had been taken off the table by the bailiffs. I was incorrect. Mr. Brooks handed the headphones to the bailiff saying he didn't want to break them. All right, so we are discussing the verdict forms. Um, go ahead, Attorney Basie, you can complete your record. Okay, Your Honor. Um, all the verdict forms look good. Um, I did notice, I think it was actually the way that it was speed. Um, for count 15, I have a not guilty verdict. I did not have a guilty verdict, but the way that it was on the paper made me believe that something happened, and I think you probably have it with your packet. It just didn't get printed off for me. We'll make sure that that's there. Any misspellings of any names? I did not see any. All right. All right, I uh, did, when we started up the video conference, uh, Mr. Brooks has been muted. I am going to unmute him right now. Um, and I should state again for the record, the all of the verdict forms, or at least the drafts, were provided to him prior to the lunch break. Um, so he would have had an opportunity to review them should he have chosen to do that. Um, do you have any position on the verdict form, sir? I wasn't provided with anything. If I was, I accepted and returned it for value. And since I'm now in another courtroom, are we going to address subject matter jurisdiction? You have yet to prove it for the record. Mr. Brooks, you were provided with the verdict forms. What you did with them, I don't know. Again, I haven't been provided with anything. They were provided to you prior to lunch, the lunch break. I haven't been provided with anything. Teresa, you had the large packet of verdict forms. What were they... How were they given to Mr. Brooks prior to the lunch break? By hand to the bailiff and the bailiff to him. To be to the last table. Mm -hmm. And the bailiffs are confirming that they that the verdict forms were provided to him on his table. I will remind you once again that I do um, it is my practice to put all of the not guilty verdicts on top of the guilty verdicts in a collated fashion. Um, again, I saw a couple of uh, just cleaning up, I would say, not with the words themselves, but just capitalization of various words within the uh, verdict forms, and I'll make sure that's done. The appropriate counts had and have the appropriate um, special verdict questions. Those special verdict questions are only as they relate to guilty verdicts related to the use of a dangerous weapon for counts uh, one through six, the homicide counts, and then 61 through, uh, I believe 60. It would be seven through. Or seven through 67 60. have that special verdict. And then the hit and run counts have the uh, special question related to did each of the counts involve the death of a person and it names the person alleged to have been killed. So those look to be all in order. I've already addressed going back to the jury instructions 315. We have done a little bit of rearranging some of the order but the content is there. It is my practice to um, read through all of the instructions up until the point of closing arguments and then I stop Parties are given their opportunity to argue the case to the jury, and then following that, there are the what I like to call the closing instructions, or uh, which are still quite lengthy in this case, given that they go through the verdict forms specifically. Um, and then, of course, the alternate jurors would be selected. Um, but given, or, no, you're not. You haven't been. So I got I got a question about the uh, the uh, the hazard for use of a dangerous weapon. 
Um, how is that being charged? Is that under 939.632? It is in the charging document, sir. Um, how is that being charged? Uh, from my understanding that the, the statute reads the increased penalty provided in this section does not apply if possessing, using, or threatening to use a dangerous weapon is an essential element of the crime charge. Without being a, without being uh without the vehicle, there is no crime. So that, that would apply. So how am I charged with um, state one is, Rather, is your is your argument only as it relates to counts one through six or others? Whichever whichever count whichever count has the the enhancement penalty for use of a dangerous weapon. Well, that would be all of the intentional homicide charges and all of the first degree of recklessly endangering safety charges. So counts one through sixty seven. So one through sixty seven. Correct. I can have the state respond to that. Yeah, how 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 is uh how is the alleged defendant being charged? Uh, so are you asking the, how the, are you making a specific request as it relates to the special verdict question? Um, I would say both. Seeing as how I don't understand how. That's why there's the question. Reading the statute. In, in which part of this? Mean? I'm sorry. Which part of the statute are you referring to again? I believe it's 939.632. And your specific argument is what again? Um, how is that enhancement, how is the alleged defendant charged with that enhancement when reading the statute it says it, well, I just read it, so. I believe you're referring to sub two, which states the increased penalty provided in this section does not apply if possessing, using, or threatening to use a dangerous weapon is an essential element of the crime charge. Right, charge, right. That's what I just read, Your Honor. Well, what's the state's response? Using, possessing, or threatening to use a dangerous weapon is not an, element, an essential element of either first degree intentional homicide or first degree recklessly endangering safety. If it were, it would be one of the elements in the standard jury instructions and the defendant can see it is not. This is uh, different from a situation like armed robbery, which does require the use or threatened use of a dangerous weapon. So uh, the penalty and answer is correctly charged for those two types of crimes. Any I'll final argument on that, sir? Yes. Um, that's not that's not what the statute is clearly saying. It clearly is clearly stated. It does not apply if possessing, using, or threatening to use a dangerous weapon is an essential element of the crime charge. If there is no vehicle involved, where is the crime? It has to be an essential essential part of it to even be to even be a crime. The, the the alleged defendant is charged with using a vehicle to commit these crimes. If there's no vehicle, where's the crime? So it has to be an essential element of the crime. Otherwise, there's no crime. I think it's the essential element. If, if, if you read in the statute, it's the essential element. You can't just walk up to some. You can't just walk up to someone and quote unquote uh, run them over. There has to be something used in order for this <coughs> alleged crime to transpire, and that would essentially mean the quote unquote dangerous weapon. So without without the. Uh, 
without the quote unquote dangerous weapon, where's the crime? So how how can it be charged when it is the the essential element of the crime charge? Well, sir, I've listened to your argument. I've read the statute. I've looked at the elements for <clears throat> intentional homicide and first degree recklessly endangering safety. Neither one of those crimes have as an element in it uh, use of a vehicle. There are certainly many different ways that both of those statutes can be violated. While it's true that in this particular case, the use of the vehicle is the mechanism or instrumentality that's being alleged to have been used, but it's not the same as being an essential element of the crime. I think the armed robbery um, crime is a good example of when you could not face an enhancer for use of a dangerous weapon because you can't have the crime of armed robbery without the threat or use of a dangerous weapon. And so... That's the same argument in this, Your Honor. You can't have this alleged crime without the use of the vehicle. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's not an essential element of either first degree intentional homicide or first degree recklessly endangering safety. So I'll deny the request to strike the enhancer for those reasons and find that it is properly before the jury for their determination. I, I respectfully object to that, Your Honor. Understood. Do you have any other challenges to the verdicts you'd like to raise at this time? Yeah, would, would that be, would my objection to that be noted for the record? It is. Now I request a legal reconsideration of your ruling, Your Honor? Denied. May I request a, a written finding of fact for your ruling, Your Honor? Denied. Just for the record, it's my understanding that the verdict forms were uh, put in the garbage by Mr. Brooks and they remain in there. That was provided to me by the bailiffs. May, may, that I respectfully, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law for, for this issue, Your Honor? You may request it. The request is denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? This is not the proper court to grant such relief. For the record, may I move to stay these proceedings until this instant matter is adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction? Your request is denied. Based on what law or fact? Your request is not based in law or fact, sir. I just stated, I just read a statute that it came from. My argument was based on a statute, a Wisconsin statute. Your request is noted. Your objection to the court's finding and determination is noted. I decline to issue any type of written decision or stay pending appeal, noting there is no appeal that has been filed. Now let the record show that this court will not allow the accused to adequately defend themselves in this matter. The court's already made its findings regarding the forfeiture of right to testify and the forfeiture of the right to present additional evidence and testimony. Not, I'm not going to revisit the same. Which was not consented to. I never stated that I did or did not understand. Want to testify. I understand. So how can that decision be made on my behalf when I didn't say either way? What I stated was I didn't understand the questions being answered. Sir, do you have any other questions or issues regarding the verdict forms? Your Honor, do, are you are you making a judicial determination that you don't have to answer any questions? I'm not answering those questions, sir, other than right, how I've that, already answered them. Is that a judicial determination? Sir, every decision I make is a determination by this court. Is it a judicial determination? Sir, I will ask you once more. Do you have any other issues to raise? And I will tell you once more, I with... don't understand the questions that you are asking. Sir, so do you I have would... any other issues to raise with respect to the verdict forms? I do not understand the questions that you are asking. He has now twice not answered the question. I'll ask one last time and specifically advise him that his failure to answer the question will be taken by this court as a no. Sir, do you have under, any under additional... Law 
under what law in fact can you say no? Sir, do you have any additional issues to raise with respect to the verdict forms? I do not understand the questions that you are asking. All right, he has chosen not to answer other than by saying he does not understand the questions. He did not specifically answer with a yes or no. Therefore, this court takes that as he does not have any additional issues to raise with respect to the verdict forms. That is incorrect. I stated I don't understand. You can't force me to understand something, Your Honor. All right, did the state have any other? I want to mute him momentarily. Mr. Brooks, I'm muting you because I'm moving on to another topic. I understand you disagree with the court's rulings, but you need to respect the rulings with proper etiquette in this courtroom, which you are demonstrating once again you're not willing to follow, so I exercise my ability to press mute. Does the state have any other requests as it relates to the jury instructions? I want to kind of full circle back to that because I do need to approve of them. We do not. All right, Mr. Brooks, I'll ask you the same question. I will unmute. Do you have any additional requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Yeah, I have questions related to all of them because I don't understand any of this. My question was not do you have questions, but do you have any requests? And my answer was I don't understand. And I've made several requests. The requests are not related to the jury instructions, which is the phase of this hearing that this court is attempting to conduct with you and give you the opportunity to fully participate. Mr. Brooks is choosing not to answer my questions. I'm going to mute him momentarily, sir. I will ask you one more time if you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions. I then will ask you if you approve of the jury instructions. If you do not answer those questions as it relates to the question, do you have any requests as it relates to jury instructions, I will interpret that as a no. And if you do not specifically answer the question about the jury instructions, I will interpret that as your approval. So first question to you is do you have any, and you're unmuted, do you have any requests at this point as it relates to the jury instructions? And I just said before, I said I do. I said I don't understand the question. Of course I have questions if I don't understand. So do you have any requests for any additional instructions that are not included or to remove any that are included? Yeah, remove them all until I understand or add the jury instructions that I have myself. What jury instructions do you have, sir? So now you don't know I had jury instructions and I told you this weeks ago. What filing are you referring to, sir? If I've overlooked that, I will certainly reconsider, but I'm not aware of a specific jury instruction. It seems like you overlook a lot, Your Honor. Can you point me to a specific filing? So you have all my filings on file? Are you saying that you have my filings and they haven't been admitted into evidence? Oh, my computer is not working. Oh, now the computer is not working. Sir, please direct me to the specific filing that you're referring to that has a request related to jury instructions. You just said, you just said you was referring to the filings, right? Did you just say that? That's not what I said. Did you just say what filings are referring to jury instructions? Did you or did you not just say that? I said, do you have a specific filing you can refer the court to that relates to jury instructions? So is your computer working or is it not working? It's being a little temperamental, but I have, I just can't use my search function. So if you can direct me to a filing, that would be great. It would also be great for those filings to be admitted into evidence. Sir, simply filing something with the court does not make it evidence during the evidentiary phase of a trial. There are rules of procedure and rules of evidence that govern that. And you told me to make all my filings in writing. Sir, I said if you had a motion, it needed to be put in writing. All those were motions. All those were motions. Sir, what filing are you referring the court to? 
We'll do all my motion. Sir, it's not my job to advocate on your behalf. If you have something I in particular. You on my sir, I ask you I ask you to do your job. Sir, if you have something a specific request, now is the time to make it. Well, how about this? I I, uh, I don't I don't accept none of those jury instructions. I, I don't I don't accept any of them. Any of them. And again I'll tell you, I don't understand. Why do I have to keep saying this? When it's clear that I don't understand. Your Honor, I can inform the court that um, jury instructions were due, I believe, on August 30th. Um, the state submitted their proposed jury instructions as well as the substantive instructions, and the defense indicated that they um, agreed with our filing. So I don't believe that there's ever been a request um, for any different jury instructions than what have been um, filed with the court. So what jury instructions are you referring to or what document is, is being referred to on the alleged defendant's behalf? Because as we all know, I didn't obtain the, uh, the discovery in full until the end of September. So there were, there was documents that I didn't even know that existed. Mr. Brooks, one final time. Do you have any specific requests as it relates to the jury instructions other than your request that they all be struck? And I'm telling you, Your Honor, I don't understand the question. I, I, I can't. All right, then I will take I, his response I, that he does not understand that he does not have any additional requests. I didn't say and that. They will be I said I don't approved. understand. They will be approved you and are. No, I'm going to have to mute no. him. They are approved as been drafted by the court and modified by, uh, during the jury instruction conference on the record this morning and this afternoon. Um, I will once again review all of them just for grammar, just to make sure all of that is correct, um, and uh, provide a written printout of the final draft for the parties before we break for the day today. I am also approving of the verdict forms that have been uh, previously submitted to the parties, just noting there's just a few grammatical things that need to be corrected, but the content and substance are there, and I've already addressed on the record um, any requests by the parties this afternoon. No, Your Honor, I believe that the, the final copy that we've been working off of is, is appropriate. Any comment by, about that, Mr. Brooks, or any statement? I don't, I don't consider to being called that name, and I've just told you I don't understand these jury questions. I'm not going to know how, how they allowed to pass just because you feel that they should. When I'm telling you, I don't understand it. I would know that those, his... Not his, one of those jury instructions came from me. Not one. How's that fair? Mr. Brooks, this court gave you the draft no, you of the jury anything. instructions. I, mean, I need anything. to mute you because, once again, he's debating about things that I think are very clear on the record. This court provided both the state and Mr. Brooks with a written printout, 107 pages long, of the jury instructions it was considering uh, in this case. We had a discussion this morning. We continued that discussion this afternoon. Prior to breaking for the lunch hour, all of the verdict forms were printed off and provided to both the state and to Mr. Brooks. Um, it is also true that when he was previously represented by counsel, uh, the court had some specific deadlines related to jury instruction proposals, and uh, the state reminded me that there essentially were, was not an objection raised regarding the proposal um, and the filing from the state. I had a brief opportunity to look through the record of the inmate communication forms that have been sent during this trial that are on file. 
I haven't seen anything that references jury instructions. Um, I'm well aware that he has other filings, uh, but I could not find anything uh, related to jury instructions and any specific request that he is making or made uh, during this case. So for the record, I am approving of the verdicts. I am approving of the jury instructions. And once again, before we break for the day, I will make sure to provide uh, the parties with written printouts of uh, both of the documents as they now stand. Then there are a few other issues we need to uh, I go through. Um, Attorney Basie, I think you brought these up prior to the break. Maybe it was Attorney Opper. Uh, in terms of s scheduling and I, what I would consider other housekeeping issues, but go ahead and remind me once again of the issues you wanted to bring up. I think it was the alternate um, sequestration and there might have been a third. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um the uh, question is to the uh, sequestration of the jurors once they are uh, excused for deliberations and should the timing require that, uh, you know, an overnight stay or something along those lines. We wanted to discuss that. We wanted to discuss what the court intended to do with the three alternates once they have been selected. Um, it would be our request and position that they should remain in a secure location separate and apart from anyone else unless and until full deliberations are complete by the 12 selected to decide the case so that if needed and um, in light of the brief COVID history we have on this record, if needed, one of the alternates uh, could slide into a uh, position of one of the 12 who are deliberating uh, if, if that became necessary. Um, so we wanted to address that, and then we just wanted to address uh, timing generally for closing arguments, uh, verdict uh, returned by the jury, and then uh, the court's intentions as to the rest of the week, uh, should there be guilty uh, verdicts returned. Sure. Um, before I address all of those, are there any of those final type of issues, sir, that you would want the court to address? You have been unmuted, so you can answer that. Mr. Brooks, do you have any of those final type of questions or issues that you want the court to address? You are unmuted. I am. I just told you I'm not. I'm not. Since since nothing since nothing I say even matters at this point, I'm just going to tell the jury what they need to know. I'm just going to tell them the truth. Mr. Brooks, you are aware that your closing arguments have to be based on law and fact, correct? I mean, they're going to be based on whatever I'll base them on. Well, I trust the state will object when appropriate, well, if appropriate. There's going to be a whole lot of objection then because I'm going to tell the truth. You, you, haven't, you haven't allowed, you've just been making all the decisions for me, even though you know I, I told you repeatedly that I don't understand and you still make decisions based on, on, on my behalf without my consent, without me. I'm telling you I don't understand and you still make a decision determining my life. Are you telling me, sir, that you will refuse to follow the simple rules of decorum, courtesy, it, 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 civility, no, the rules of evidence, don't, don't try to and come, don't try to come the rules of procedure? Words. Don't try to come with your slick words and don't put words in my mouth. Sir, I am not being slick. I'm trying to you, preserve you the been, integrity. Okay, you've been slick. You've right. been slick. All right. I'm going to mute you, sir, since what you are saying is not productive. It is not courteous. It is disrespectful. I, don't care I what need you to. Think. I need to go I don't over care these. What you think. All right, I'm muting him because I need to go over these important issues that have been raised by the state. So, as far as the alternates, I do think it is important to keep the um, alternates who 
uh, in a secure location, even if that means an overnight, um, unless and until verdicts are reached in this matter, and I will uh, so instruct the clerk of courts to make those arrangements. We have been doing that all along in any event. Um, as far as selecting the alternates, um, obviously each of our jurors have a number. I intend to have uh, pieces of um, uh, equal size pieces of paper made, folded up with each of their numbers, put them in the uh, same turnstile bin that we utilized for the selection of jury uh, preemptory strikes by lot and to simply pull out three names those will be the alternates and then the or I should say not names the numbers and then the numbers that are remaining would be those 12 who will deliberate um, and so I'll have I'll make sure that that's out here uh, for the appropriate time. As I indicated this morning, uh, all of the jurors were provided with um, some information regarding sequestration. It is the practice of, uh, that I've uh, approved in this case that the jurors provide us with certain emergency contact information so that we are able to get a hold of families should there be the need. They're given information regarding sequestration, the purpose of it. If I have not made that a part of the record, I will make sure to get a copy of that uh, filed in this case so that uh, both sides know what was provided to uh, the jurors uh, today before they left. And then I'll also make sure that when the 12 are deliberating, that the three who are not are taken to a different uh, jury room with um, a bailiff, um, and again, kept in a secure location, but separate from the other 12. Uh, in the event one would be needed, we would then take up that issue at that time, but I think it's good practice to have them available if that becomes an issue. Uh, as far as timing, I'll first address, um, I have instructed the jurors to be back at 9 a.m. That's because typically we have a few things to finalize in the morning, so we'll start at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, I will, it will also give the parties one final opportunity to read through the many, many pages of jury instructions and verdict forms to just make sure there aren't any other issues that jump off the page or that need to be addressed first thing tomorrow morning. But then I do intend to start with instructing the jury. This case will require a, a very lengthy time of the court reading off the jury instructions. I do believe it will require me to take some regular breaks, probably every two hours, until the jury instructions are read with perhaps uh, a longer break at the lunch hour. And um, my best guess is that it'll take between five and six hours to fully instruct the jury. That's based on the 107 pages. Now, some of those pages though are after argument. And so that really kind of begs the question is, will the parties get to their closing arguments tomorrow or will that be done Wednesday morning? I certainly would like to have the parties make their arguments. Um, Madam yeah, Clerk, may I see the instructions that we have thus far? The packet? I just... Okay, thank you. So given... So the instructions that I read prior to the parties giving their closing arguments uh, finishes on page 73. So it, given that, I believe that the parties will be able to give their closing arguments tomorrow. It just may be, depending on where that takes us, whether the final instructions are given 
the following morning because that's another 30 pages. I'd like to be able to do it. Um, it just really depends on how late of an evening. Um, I'm not opposed to going late, but letting the jurors go to the hotel and then starting their deliberations in the morning if that's what needs to be done. Understood, and we'll be ready. I think from our recollection, it took you about two and a half hours to read the preliminary instructions, which was 69 pages in length. So if that holds, I think you know we reasonably could do closings in the afternoon, and it'd probably take you about an hour, hour and a half to read those remaining 30 pages. And we may still be able to wrap up by four or five o'clock in the courtroom. I think that's a reasonable time frame. Do you have any estimation uh, on the length of your closing? I'm contemplating maybe putting a time restriction for both parties. I mean, it's a, yes. we had a solid 15 days of testimony, so I'm mindful that this is not a 30 minute closing. Well, um, actually I'm trying to keep it in the 30 to 45 minute range, just um, out of courtesy to the jury. Uh, and to highlight the important points. Do you think it would be reasonable to give the parties each an hour total that would reserve whatever's left from your initial for your any rebuttal? Yes. All right, Mr. Brooks, do you have any position on that? I am unmuting you. I would note he takes the headphones on and off throughout. He doesn't have them on. He's looking at a book. I wish you would stop saying the book. I'm looking at the Bible. Thank you. Not just a book. It's the book. Can't disagree with you there, sir. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I mean, people actually live by it, though. Anyway. Sir, I'm contemplating putting an hour time limit on closing arguments. I ain't doing no closing arguments tomorrow. Um, the closing arguments will most likely be tomorrow. Given I'm not doing it tomorrow. Then you'll forfeit your right to give one, sir, because as we have you can't you can't force me you can't force me not what type what type of court is this where you can say you're gonna force somebody not to be able to give a closing argument? How sir, is that law law? Sir, football? if you choose How not to give law one ah 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 how's that law for law? Sir, if you choose not Damn. to give Good one God. at you're not letting me finish and you're mocking me because. right now, which is incredibly disrespectful once again. Okay, you didn't even let me get my sentence out. You always want to make an incorrect record. Go ahead. Go ahead. Make your incorrect record. Go ahead. I'll, I'll mute him once again because clearly he just wants to be disruptive this afternoon. But as we have been talking about over the course of the last, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, talking about the timing of everything tomorrow, even though I have 107 pages of jury instructions, um, the first 73, I think, deal with what is read prior to closing arguments. That means the parties should be prepared to give their closing arguments tomorrow afternoon. Um, I will do my very best with just one mid-morning break to get through all of these, the first part of the instructions. Then the state will give its closing argument. Um, I'm giving the parties one hour each. I think that's reasonable under the circumstances. Um, whatever the state doesn't use in its initial time of closing arguments, it can reserve for rebuttal. But then following the state, there, we may need to take a break of some sorts, probably before the defendant goes, just for the jury's sake and the party's sake, we will need a comfort break. Uh, but you should be prepared to go tomorrow afternoon then the state, if they have any rebuttal, will get up within that time limit. I will uh, myself and I'll have my clerk make sure we um, accurately time that. I will read the final instructions and I'll really leave it in the jury's hands. If they want to start deliberating, that's fine. You know, if it's seven o'clock at night, I'll probably tell them um, we're going to break for the night. They'll be sequestered, but they will come back and begin deliberations in the morning. Um, that will be Wednesday morning. But there's now that I've really kind of laid that out and thought about the break I will have for closing arguments with even my 107 pages, we can get this done tomorrow. Um, and so that's my expectation. So 
uh, Mr. Brooks, I'll unmute you, but that is the expectation of the court that closing arguments will be done tomorrow. You can't, you can't rush me to judgment or you can't practice law from the bench and tell me when I can do something and when I can't. Mr. Brooks, I actually can under all of the rules of procedure. It is my job to make sure there's effective okay. and efficient administration of this trial. So, you so are then, then I, I should be allowed to, then if that's the case, then I should be allowed to tell the jury what they need to know, which is the truth, that they have the power. They have the power to nullify laws. To tell them you are them. absolutely not allowed to tell the jury that. There's a jury instruction that I will have ready to go if you even attempt to raise the issue of jury nullification, oh, so, sir. You have so, absolutely so. no right to raise that. That is oh, clear under the law. I can raise I can raise what I want to raise. And you can't so you added these jury instructions at the last minute, then you should have never approved them from the get-go because I never approved them. I told you I didn't understand them at all whatsoever. And you still passed it. Sir, if you understand jury nullification, you understand jury instructions. It clear to Man, me you've done your homework. I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care what you're talking about. I'm going to let them know that they can nullify any law they don't agree with, which is my right. It is not your now, right to do that. Not. Say it is not. It is tell not your not. right to raise show jury me. nullification. Show me lawful law then. Show me. All right. I'm going to mute him once again. He's starting to raise his voice. He's starting to hit his hands on the table. It's very clear to this court that uh, it's going to be a challenge tomorrow during his closing arguments. Um, he does not have an unfettered right to say whatever he wants or how he wants. Um, if he um, is going to be adamant about defying the court's rules, which I will tell him in part what they are today and I will work on that as we break and have a very clear advisement for him tomorrow morning, um, he may run the risk of being put in the other courtroom because he'll forfeit by his conduct his right to be present here and I will be able then to exercise the mute function. I have to balance, frankly, the fact that he's in custody, that it takes time for this jury to be excused. They have to walk an entire hallway behind me. I frankly don't want him to look um, worse than what he's looked, frankly, in front of this court when they haven't been in this courtroom. I need to preserve how he looks to this jury. And I will need a very clear pledge by him that he will follow the rulings that I make as it, re as it relates to the closing arguments. He cannot raise jury nullification. He cannot raise facts that are not part of the record. Um, he cannot raise subject matter jurisdiction. Um, he needs to argue the facts based upon his theory, uh, based upon the evidence that's been presented. Um, <coughs> and those are the bounds. Um, if he's going to, I, I can only imagine there may be some objections by the state. If there is an objection, I expect that he will stop and wait for this court to rule on the objection. I expect that if I sustain an objection, that he will honor it. And if he can't pledge to follow these very simple rules of courtesy and decorum that are consistent with the rules of procedure and the rules of evidence, then he will, very, he will be in that other courtroom for the, his closing argument so that I can exercise mute, frankly, to protect how he looks to that jury. Because that is the balancing that I am tasked with tomorrow, is to ensure that this jury makes a determination based upon the evidence and the law. You do not have a right to talk about sympathy. That's very clear in the case law, whether it's evidence or arguments. The juries, if you read through the jury instructions, sir, you will see they are specifically told they will not be swayed by sympathy, by prejudice, or passion. They are not to be concerned themselves with any penalties. You can't argue penalties. You can't argue jury nullification. You can't argue legal issues that aren't relevant to the elements and the other law that's in these jury instructions. And those are the very clear rules that you will need to follow. And like any other time, 
in this trial, if you don't do that, you will forfeit your right to argue your case to the jury or forfeit your right to be present for in this courtroom and appear from the other courtroom. And I'm put, that is, you are squarely put on notice of that here today, sir. With that, I think I've addressed all of the issues the state has asked me to address. Oh, one other issue, verdict timing. I know we have some time on this. I realize that there are many, many victims who may still be watching the proceedings remotely. Um, there may be news media, in fact, that may want to cover the verdicts um, and that this jury will take some time due to the sheer volume of counts in this case. When this court is advised that verdicts have been reached, I am contemplating between 30 and 60 minutes before bringing everyone back into the courtroom for uh, the verdicts to be read in open court. Um, and if parties believe I need to wait longer, uh, then let me know. But I think um, I think some of it will depend on how is it late at night? Is it during the day, you know, are we dealing with any kind of traffic issues? I realize Mr. Brooks has family in Milwaukee area that may want to be here as well. Um, even if I consider kind of, you know, the outlying areas of Waukesha, you could be as much as 30 minutes away. So that's my initial thought on that. Any statement from the state on that? Not on that issue directly, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. It's okay. I apologize. Any other issues? Yes. Uh, my other issue as to verdicts was seating, if you intended to maintain the designated benches for the reasons you just said. I would intend to keep the seating as is. Okay. With the uh, reserve? The entire uh, side behind the state for victims. Okay. And the other side Public. reserved for the first five minutes or... Is that open seating over there? Uh, my previous about? or my rule throughout has been 15 minutes. Um, what I would say is any open seating will open the courtroom. It'll still be open the whole time because we're waiting, right? So it has to be. So any seat that's left open within 15 minutes, uh, victims could also sit on the other side. Okay. If that's what you're asking me. Yes. All right. Mr. Brooks, any further? Topics by you. Am I muted? No, you're unmuted. So, again, I don't understand nothing you just said, but um, I don't. How, how can you how can you deprive me of my constitutional right? How can you trample on my constitutional right? How? Sir, you can forfeit a number of constitutional rights by uh, misconduct on your part. Not if I reserve my rights, you can't, you can't let me reserve my rights and take them from you. Sir, I direct your attention to Chambers versus Mississippi, Rock versus Arkansas, State versus Anthony, Illinois versus Allen. Did they reserve their rights? The Benaby decision. There, there's a host they, of case they, law, sir. Did they reserve their rights? All right, sir, you are simply mistaken on that. So I'm muting him once again. He's not giving me any other issues uh, to address. Um, we are in recess. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, I have a few other. I'm you sorry. do. I'm yes. sorry, go ahead. Um, I just wanted the record to reflect that at about 2.04 p.m., your clerk had uh, provided the final version of jury instructions to both the state and to the defense. I watched on video as Deputy Wittig left this courtroom, went over to the other courtroom, handed the final jury instructions to Mr. Brooks, and he immediately turned and dropped them to his left off the side of the table. I can't tell from the video if that's where the trash can is located or not, but I did see that immediate response after he was handed the final jury instructions. Uh, another did that thing. include the verdicts or just the jury instructions? No, just the jury instructions Okay, it's just the jury instructions. But okay. thank you, because I didn't see that given some of the things I was looking at up here. So I appreciate that. Uh, were, were all jurors or will all jurors then be told to report with an overnight bag? That's part of the instructions. Okay, that they were and, and you're going to make that available to us. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll get uh, Lauren down here right away, and I'll make sure that before Mr. Brooks um, is taken back to the cell 
Um, I see your arms waving. I'll get you in a second. That that he's provided with that as well. All right, and you and, as well. And then one final thing as to timing. And again, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Mr. Brooks or anyone involved in this matter, but should there be any guilty verdicts in this case, would you be intending to proceed to sentencing yet this week or at a future time? You know, that's an interesting question because I don't know how many victims will want to speak. Um, if we have time, I would certainly consider that. I mean, I have this entire week set aside yet. Um, and I have Monday morning, but I have some other things Monday afternoon, and then I am not available the rest of next week. So it really just depends on the timing. Um, I would need to know from both the parties whether, whether they anticipate anyone speaking other than the parties themselves. Any family members? Yes. I don't we, think I need a PSI. This is a trial. This is not like a, a guilty plea. So, Mr. Brooks, I'll get you. I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're unmuted. Hey, since we're all making records to make you look bad, I think we should say for the record that one of the rights I have is to demand that the court place in the evidence any unrevealed contract, statute, laws, rules, or information being used against me under the Sixth Amendment. So how come how come that hasn't been placed in the evidence? What law are you referring to, sir? I'm, I'm referring to my rights under the Sixth Amendment. And, and what my case law says right you have a right to do exactly what you just said you have a right to do? The Constitution, Amendment 6. Sir, that is very general, your statement. It's vague. There's nothing so specific you have so referenced. You want, you, want, you want paragraph 2 or something like that? Is that what you want? No, that's not what I'm saying, sir. You're making so, general arguments also, that aren't based in fact yeah. and are over generalizations of what the law requires as well. I accept for value and return for value any documents in this matter. Since, you know, it, it might be another record of what I'm doing, you know, since it's always a record of what I'm doing. And I also have the right. I also have the right to ask, is this common law or advocacy law? Because judging by the gold eagle on top of the flag, it, it's some explaining that needs to be done. That is a military symbol. So is this a common law court or advocacy law court? Mr. Brooks, I'm frankly not going to address these nonsense legal theories of yours. I'm muting you. Um, they have been debunked. They are typical sovereign tactics that have no place in our judicial system. Um, we are in recess. I'll see everyone tomorrow morning at 8.30. I'll just direct the bailiffs to wait until we have the verdict forms to give. And if it takes us longer than 30 minutes, we'll make sure they're delivered to him in his jail today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.